Delighted to welcome you all to the 2020 Yuga Awards Ceremony. I am your host for the evening, George R.R. R. Martin. Those of you who were present at last year's Yuga Awards may know me best as the author of A Cream of Thrones. Of course, I thought I would be doing this in person in Wellington, New Zealand on a stage. Instead, I'm coming to you from Santa Fe, New Mexico, from my own theater, the Jean Cocteau Cinema, which of course is closed down and quarantined, as you can see. Uh, and I'm going out all over the world. Uh, this is truly a world con. You know, this would have been the first time world con had ever gone to New Zealand. And I know a lot of us were looking forward to going to New Zealand for the first time, or returning to New Zealand, if we've been lucky enough to be there before. It's a, it's a gorgeous country. Um, and I think the fans of New Zealand, who are an amazing, hospitable, friendly bunch, were looking forward to welcoming the world to their doorstep. Sadly, that hasn't happened, thanks to the coronavirus. And uh, we're exploring new territory here, so we can see how this uh, virtual stuff works with uh, Zoom and Discord and this, that, and the other thing. But there are advantages to this, and one of them is that I think the, the global reach of the convention, if anything, should be greater. Um, had we been in Wellington, of course, we would have had a lot of uh, Americans. They, they turn up wherever the convention is, probably a good deal of Brits, too. We would have had a lot of New Zealanders, Kiwis, attending their very first convention. We'd have had a lot of people from Australia or the West Island, as the New Zealanders call it. Uh, possibly a lot of people from Asia as well, um, some from Europe, who knows. But I think because we're on the internet, we're global, we're probably being seen in countries by people who would have no chance to make the convention had it been in person. And I want to reach out to those people and say a special welcome. Um, fandom, science fiction, fantasy fandom uh, goes all the way back to the 20s and 30s. And almost from the start, it's always been a global community. We're united by our love of science fiction and fantasy, by the books and the movies that uh, we grew up on and cut our teeth on and enjoyed. And those books and movies have been translated into languages all over the world. So I want to welcome uh, the people who could have come, but also the people who could not have come, who may be watching it today. I, I hope uh, that we're being watched all over Europe. I hope uh, a lot of my friends in Spain, an amazing country, are, are plugged in here. Um, the people from Portugal, the people from France and, and um, Germany, Sibel, I hope you're watching, um, from Scandinavia, from Eastern Europe, uh, the great fans that I've met on my travels to Croatia and to the Czech Republic and the other countries of Eastern Europe where I hope to go. I hope we're being watched in the Arab world. I want to say a special thanks and a salute to the fans from Saudi Arabia who just bid for a Worldcon, and I hear they're going to do it again. But from the rest of the Arab world too, I hope we're being watched in, in Egypt and in Morocco and in the whole rest of the world. And I hope we're being watched in India and Nepal and China, which is bidding for a world con, in Japan, um, in South America. I hope we're being watched in Africa. I know we have Nnedi Okorafor, the wonderful Nigerian American uh, author is, uh, and friend of mine is one of our presenters tonight. I hope some of her friends from Lagos are, are tuning in to see tonight. So, Yes, I've probably left out 150 countries, no offense done. I don't have a list of every country in the world here, 
But I'm going to be interested at the end of this to see how many countries we were watched in, how many people have watched this from all over the world, because I think the more, the merrier. Worldcon is and should be a Worldcon, and uh, I, I hope to go to many of the countries that I've never been before and meet my readers there, meet the fans there, learn a little about their culture, eat their exotic cuisine, and uh, strengthen the bonds of fandom, which is truly an international community. Now, last year's ceremony was in Dublin, of course, and many of you were not present for that. And since this is the first time that it's ever been in New Zealand, even virtually, some of you have may never have been or witnessed a Yugo Award ceremony before. I had planned, if I was doing this in person on a stage in Wellington, to ask for a show of hands at this point to see how many people were at their first Yugo Award. So I think I'll, I'll still go ahead and do that. Uh, go ahead, put up your hands, all of you, uh, whether you're in Africa or Saudi Arabia or Finland um, or wherever you are, put up your hands if, if you are attending or viewing your first Yugo Award ceremony. Don't be shy, come on, put them up. Okay, I can't see your hands, of course, so you can put them down now, unless you just want to go to the toilet, in which case, yeah, go ahead, you don't, you don't need my permission. So all of you first timers, from whatever country you're watching this, you may be wondering what to expect from this night. Most of you have seen other award shows, of course. You've seen the Oscars, the Emmys, the Tonys, the Grammys, the BAFTAs, whatever they have down there in New Zealand. Will the Yugos be like that, you may be asking yourself. Well, yes and no. There will be less singing. I think I am safe in saying that. We have had singing Toastmasters in the past, but I am not one of those. There will be no dancing whatsoever, not unless some winner wants to surprise us all by doing a jig. That would be a first, I'd think. There will be, I, I suspect, I don't know for sure, but I suspect there will be cats. Because we're going into the homes of winners from all over the United States and Australia and the world. And, and one thing that a lot of science fiction writers and fans have in common are cats. So some of those cats may jump up by the computer, they may be in their lap, who knows. I couldn't bring my own cat, but I did, I did bring a, a Lannister lion here to, uh, to stand in for, uh, for the cats. So we will, we will possibly have some cats during the ceremony. And as, as a Hugo winning short story told us a few years ago, more cat pictures, please. You can't have too many cats. Um, that being said, no one is likely to come on stage in costume from the movie Cats. I can pretty much guarantee that. Not that strange costumes are entirely unknown at Worldcon. Old timers will tell you that many, many years ago at a Worldcon in Washington, DC, where we're going next year, uh, a young fan stripped to his tidy whities covered himself head to toe in chunky peanut butter and came on stage as the human turd. But that was for the masquerade. It would never have been allowed in the Yugo Awards. I'm almost sure. Aside from that, anything that has ever happened at those other award shows has happened at the Yugos too. And many other weird things besides. Remember when they announced the wrong winner at the Oscars? The Yugos did it first. And there was the time George C. Scott refused an Oscar, and a few years later, Marlon Brando did the same. Remember that? No? Too young? Well, they did. We've had winners refuse Yugos as well. We've also had a winner drop and break his Yugo moments after accepting that, before he even got off the stage. Another gave an acceptance speech that was so animated and funny and exciting 
that it was nominated for Best Dramatic Presentation the following year. And one of my predecessors as Toastmaster conducted the entire ceremony while on roller skates. On a stage, was slightly tilted, so he was always in danger of rolling off into the laps of the people in the first row. You won't see that at the Oscars. And I can promise you, you also won't see it here tonight. I, I, you have my word, I am not on roller skates. I make no promises about pants. Hosting these awards is, is uh, no easy gig, let me tell you. Last year in Dublin, um, they had the artist Afua Richardson, who draws, plays the flute, and sings beautifully. I don't draw. I can't play the flute. And you have to get me really drunk to get me to sing. And then it's all, only old TV theme songs. Back in the last century, uh, the Yugos tended to call upon the same hosts to preside over and over again at the Yugo award ceremonies. They found someone who was good at it and they called upon them multiple times. There was the ebullient Isaac Asimov, the Bob Hope of science fiction. Ike and Bob both actually used the same shtick, handing out the rockets while complaining loudly about never getting one themselves. Uh, which was a very funny routine the first five or six times. Eventually, uh, the Oscars and the Yugos both got so tired of hearing it, however, that they gave Isaac and Bob, respectively, uh, uh, Oscars and Yugos just to shut them up. WorldCon also had the warm and homey Bob Tucker, the, the Johnny Carson of science fiction. We had Robert Block, author of Psycho, dry-witted, self-effacing, who liked to say he had the heart of a small boy in a jar on his desk. Worldcons that felt especially bold would call upon Harlan Ellison, the Ricky Gervais of science fiction. Collecting award from Harlan took a certain amount of courage. And of course, Worldcon often had Robert Silverberg who has told me that he would like to be called the Cary Grant of science fiction, but I don't know that I want to go there. Silver Bob is the only man to have attended every Hugo ceremony, from the first one in 1953, right up until tonight. During that time, he has won a few rockets himself, lost quite a few more, and handed out more than anyone can possibly remember. Silverberg was the Toastmaster at the very first Yugo ceremony I ever attended. It was 1971 in Boston at NorisCon 1, and I, I remember it vividly. In Yugos, as in sex, you always remember the first time. The past is another country, as they say. They do things differently there. In those days of yore when legends walked the earth, and I still look like Kit Harrington. The Yugos were presented at a banquet. Worldcons were in hotels in those days, not in convention centers. So you'd get the usual hotel food, rubber chicken, bouncing potatoes, overdone steaks, and something hideous for the vegetable people. Then, off as not, you'd get speeches from the guests of honor. And finally, the Toastmaster would come out and give away the rockets. Of course, it costs money to attend those banquets. Sometimes as much as seven bucks. And in 1970 way, 1971, <laughs> no way I had that kind of wealth. It had taken all the nickels I could spare to pay for the Greyhound up to Boston from New Jersey. The CONCOM did provide for people like me who wanted to watch the Yugo Awards but could not afford the rubber chicken. After the diners were done dining, they opened the door to the banquet, to the balcony above the ballroom, and those without a banquet ticket were allowed to come in and watch. That's how I viewed my first Yugo Awards. There wasn't enough seats, so I stood for the entire ceremony, 
looking down on the winners and the losers alike, watching Robert Silverberg award the rockets. Slender, elegant, sardonic, with dark hair, a dark pointed beard that made him look not quite so much like Cary Grant and maybe a little more like Satan. He was eloquent and witty, as polished as any Oscar host, the consummate Toastmaster. I had sold two stories by that point in my career. One had actually been published, and I was on my way to Chicago to begin alternative service with Vista. I had a master's degree in journalism, freshly minted, and was still half thinking that maybe I'd pursue reporting as a career and write fiction on the side, like at Clifford D. Simak, who was the guest of honor at that work on. But that night, that Yugo ceremony got into my blood. I want to be a part of this world, I remember thinking. Someday, I want to be up on that stage. Someday, I want to win a Yugo. Now, I don't ever recall thinking, someday I want to hand them out. But here we are. 39 years later, 39 Yugo Award ceremonies, and I'm the host. And I finally have a chair. Anyway, let's give out some awards. We should open our Yugo Awards by giving out two awards that are not a Yugo. These two awards, one quite new and one dating all the way back to 1973, are voted on by the members of Worldcon in the same way as the Yugo Awards and presented with them, but the winners do not receive the coveted silver rocket ship, and the World Science Fiction Societies have not determined the eligibility rules. The first of these, the baby, is the Lodestar Award for the best young adult book of the year. The Lodestar may be uh, relatively new, but young adult books are not. In the old days, when dinosaurs ruled the earth, we called them juveniles. Robert A. Heinlein wrote one a year for most of the 1950s, and those famous Heinlein juveniles were the books that opened the doors to science fiction for many of the writers of my generation, myself included. One of them, Half Space Will Travel, was the very first science fiction book I ever read. I gobbled down all the Heinlein juveniles after that, and went on to Andre Norton, Ace Doubles, and uh, the eight-volume Tom Corbett series. Tom, Roger Manning, Astro, the crew of the Polaris, uh, I was hooked after that. There was no Lodestar back then, but Have Space It Will Travel was nominated for Hugo in 1959 and lost to James Blish, one of Heinlein's few Hugo defeats. Had there been a Lodestar, I suspect Heinlein would have won it. There was no Lodestar in 2001 at Millennium Philcon either. A real pity. If there had been, maybe Harry Potter wouldn't have kicked my ass. We have a Lodestar now, though, and this year's nominees are Catfishing on Catnet by Naomi Kritzer, 14. Deep Light by Francis Harding, Macmillan. Dragon Pearl by Yoon Ha Lee, Disney, Hyperion. Minor Mage by T. Kingfisher, Argyle. Riverland by Fran Weil, Amulet. And The Wicked King by Holly Black, Little Brown Hotkey. Now, we go live to Santa Fe to announce the winner of the Lodestar Award. So, just to be clear what's happening here, you just saw videotaped me recording the introduction and reading the winner some time ago. And now you're back to live me at the Cocteau Theater. And um, so we have myself introducing many of the awards and reading the winners. And in some cases we have guest presenters who will be doing that. Most of them are videotaped. Um, 
but I have all the little envelopes here that have the winners. So uh, myself and a few guest envelope rippers and winners will be presenting that there. And then if, if the high tech is all working, after I announce or someone else announces the name of the winner, we will cut to that winner. Somewhere in the world, if Zoom is working and Discord is working and they're sitting in front of their computer and the internet decides to take mercy pause. Um, so let's see who wins the Lodestar. It's a good night for cats. The winner is Catfishing on Catnet by Naomi Kritzer. We would like to send congratulations to Naomi Kritzer for winning the Lodestar Award. Kamau Te Wehi. Thank you all so very much for this honor. Catfishing on Catnet is a story about the power of online friendship, about how online friends are real friends and the virtual world is a real place that can provide kindness, support, love, meaning, and understanding. This year has forced all of us to explore ways to connect through virtual space and to discover both its strengths and its limitations. Thank you to everyone who read this book and I'm so glad that it spoke to you. I would like to thank my editor, Susan Chang, for her insight, patience, and encouragement, as well as all the members of the Weird Smiths Writers Group, Lida Morehouse, Eleanor Arneson, Theo Lorenz, Adam Stemple, and Kelly Barnhill. Finally, I would like to thank my husband, Ed, and my children, Molly and Kira, who are just off camera, who have given me love, support, belief, and occasional slack with household chores when deadlines were imminent. I love everyone in this bar. Thank you all so much. The second of the two Not A Yugos that we will be presenting tonight is the Astounding Award for the Best New Writer in Science Fiction or Fantasy, sponsored by Dell Magazines. To be eligible, you must have been published for the first time in the preceding two years. It is worth mentioning that while the New Writer Award is not a Yugo, that has not always been the case. In 1953 at Philadelphia, Philip Jose Farmer was given a rocket for best new SF author or artist, a somewhat odd juxtaposition. There were no Yugos in 1954 and no New Writer Award in 1955, but in 1956, the third time the awards were given, they had a category called Most Promising New Author. The nominees were Henry Still, Frank Herbert, Harlan Ellison, and Robert Silverberg. The award was won by the teenaged Robert Silverberg, who did not look quite so much like Satan at that time. He remains the youngest winner in the history of the Hugo Awards. Worldcon gave him an Oldsmobile hood ornament fastened to a plank. And then, looking at the nominees, Herbert, Ellison, Silverberg, thought, well, that's not working, and promptly abolished the award. They tried it once more in 1959. Faced with a choice between Kit Reed, Brian W. Aldous, and several other promising newcomers, detention gave the Yugo to no award. Damn, tough town, Detroit. Thereafter, new writers went unrecognized and unrewarded for more than a decade until John W. Campbell Jr. passed away in 1971 at his home in New Jersey. Himself a new writer in the 1930s, both under his own name and the pseudonym Don A. Stewart, Campbell had taken over the editorship of the pulp magazine Astounding Stories of Super Science in late 1937 and transformed it into the most important science fiction magazine of the time, first as Astounding Science Fiction and later as Analog. He also founded and edited the influential fantasy magazine Unknown. Widely regarded as the architect of the golden age of science fiction, Campbell was best known for his work with new writers. He began his reign at Astounding with the discovery of such talents as Isaac Asimov, Robert A. Heinlein, A. Van Vogt, and, uh, yes, L. Ron Hubbard. Asimov never failed to credit Campbell with helping create his Three Laws of Robotics and inspiring his classic story, Nightfall. In later years, Campbell would discover, mentor, and work with Theodore Sturgeon, Arthur C. Clarke, Gordon R. Dixon, Harry Harrison, 
Frank Herbert, and the first woman ever to win a Yugo, Anne McCaffrey. In recognition of his lifetime of work discovering and promoting new talent, Analog's publisher at the time, Condé Nast Publications, created the John W. Campbell Award for the Best New Writer and asked WorldCon to administer it. Though not a Yugo, the award has been part of the Yugo ceremony ever since. The first time the Campbell Award was given was 1973 at the WorldCon in Toronto. I remember that well because, as it happens, I was one of that year's nominees. It was my second WorldCon. I had not been able to afford to travel to the 1972 WorldCon in Los Angeles, but I was determined to make Toronto. I had come up considerably in the science fiction world since Maurice Con won two years before, writing and publishing a dozen or so short stories, some of which had been very well received. Still, when I got the letter telling me I was a nominee for this brand new, just created Campbell Award, I was through the moon. There was no internet in those days, no eligibility posts, no slates, no campaigning. You just publish your stories and hope that someone noticed. And someone had. I had no illusions about winning, however. There were six finalists for that first Campbell Award. Besides me, there was Robert Thurston, Ruth Berman, and the young Texas writer Lisa Tuttle, who soon became one of my dearest friends. But all of us knew that the contest was really between Jerry Pornell and George Alec Effinger. It was 1973, and the old wave, new wave fight was still rippling through the field. Jerry was a giant to the traditionalists, piglet to the new wavers. The rest of us did not have a chance. I didn't care. I was on the ballot. I would have gotten my ass to Toronto if I'd had to hitchhike. Fortunately, Greyhound was still running, so I didn't have to. At Norris Con, I slept on a floor. But by Nor Torcon 1, I had enough money to get a room, a first for me. The banquet, though, that was still way beyond my means. I think they wanted $8 by then. So once again, after the elite of the field had finished eating, I was admitted together with the other fans who had not been able to afford banquet tickets. We were allowed to sit in rows of stacking chairs in the back, behind all the tables. But then a funny thing happened. Remember, I, I told you earlier, weird things can happen at the Yugos. Lester Del Rey was the Toastmaster that year. And for some reason, known only to himself, and now lost in the mists of time and vanished legend, Lester decided to give out the awards backwards. In those long ago days of Yugo banquets, the ceremonies often started with the presentation of the first fandom and Big Heart Awards, went on to the fan awards, the editors, dramatic presentation, and ended with the four fiction categories. The last one being best novel. All Yugos are the same size, of course. Never mind my jokes about best novel being the big one. You can see for yourself if you look at the Yugos. Still, best novel is our own analog of best picture at the Oscars or best dramatic series at the Emmys. So traditionally, it is given last to keep people in their seats. Lester gave it out first. There was a certain amount of confusion and puzzlement, then applause. Then the winner went up and collected uh, well, I, I'll get to that later. The winner and their friends left the stage and then, having less interest in the other categories, I suppose, headed off to the bar to celebrate. Some of the losers, the best novel runners-up, slipped out as well to drown their sorrows, I suppose. Meanwhile, Lester went on to best novella, best novelette, and down the list. The ballroom began to empty, table by table. That was good for me. I was in the back with the other people who had not been able to afford tickets. Some of them were leaving too, but not me. I moved up closer to the head table and the podium, grabbing a seat at one of the empty banquet tables. Remember, this was the first year the Campbell Award had ever been given. Most of the attendees had never heard of it and did not care who won. So they left, and table by table I crept closer. Lester gave out the fan awards. 
and then the Big Heart, and then the first Fandom Award. Those winners left too. By the time he reached the John W. Campbell Award for Best New Writer, there was no one left in the ballroom but me and the other finalists and acceptors. The vote had been so close, Lester announced, that Condé Nast had decided to give a special plaque to the runner-up. That went to George Alec Effinger, who thereby became the only person in the history of the Hugo Awards to ever get a trophy for finishing second. The winner, of course, was Jerry Pornell, who accepted in front of me, his family, and an empty hole. He and Piglet did get actual plaques, though, but uh, more on that later. Someday I want to be on that stage, I had told myself two years earlier. I had not made it, but I got close. By the end, I was sitting with the dirty dishes at a table right under Lester in the podium. And even though I was a Campbell loser, I did think this new writer award was a pretty good thing, and maybe should have an anthology of its own. From that, my New Voices series was born, and thence my career as an editor in this field. Proof positive that it is an honor just to be nominated. Tonight, we have six young men and women sitting and sweating all around the world, just as I did back in 1973. Here's nominees for the astounding award for Best New Writer, sponsored by Dell Magazine, R. Sam Hawk, R.F. Quang, Jen Lyons, Nibadita Sen, Tasha Suri, and Emily Tesh. Here I am again with another envelope, the winner of this year's astounding award for Best New Writer is Rebecca Quang. Rebecca Quang, congratulations, our astounding new writer. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who voted. It means a lot. And thank you to my agent, Hannah Bowman, and my editors, David Primerico and Natasha Barden, for everything you've done for my career. Um, I'll just say quickly, the Astounding Award is the award for the best new writer. Um, but if I were talking to a new writer coming to the genre in 2020, I would tell them, well, if you are an author of color, um, you will very likely be paid only a fraction of the advance that white writers are getting. Um, you will be pigeonholed, you will be miscategorized, you will be lumped in with other authors of color whose work doesn't remotely resemble yours. Um, the chances are very high that you will be sexually harassed at conventions or the target of racist microaggressions or very often just overt racism. Um, people will mispronounce your name repeatedly and in public, even people who are on your publishing team. Your cover art will be racist and you'll have to push against that. And the way people talk about you and your literature will be tied to your identity um, and your personal trauma instead of the stories you're actually trying to tell. And if I had known all of that when I <laughs> went into the industry, I don't know if I would have done it. So I think that the best way that we can celebrate new writers is to make this industry more welcoming for everyone. And now we come to the Hugo Awards. But before we start handing any of them out though, a few words about the trophy, what the winners will actually be receiving tonight or whenever the trophies get mailed to them. The Oscars have their little golden man. 
Well, actually, he's he's a golden eunuch since he has no, uh, well, you know about that. The Emmys have a winged woman holding a round thingamabobby with very sharp wings. You have to be careful of that. The Yugos have their iconic silver rocket ship. And yes, rocket ship is the correct term. The roots of the, this one goes way, way back. What do they look like? Well, fortunately, I've, I've won a Yugo or two. And uh, I can I can show you. So uh, here we go. Uh, the 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 Yugo Award. Um, this uh, actually is a tripod. It looks it looks more like a Martian war machine come to it than it does a a Yugo Award. Um, but it's 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 very silvery and and very bright. And I remember seeing like twenty of these in the shop of window of store in Amsterdam. If they they were, sell they were selling Yugos? No, that's not right. Oh, wait a minute. This is not a Yugo Award. I'm sorry. This... This is a juicer! <laughs> yes! Uh, it, it, wonderful, you know, if you don't have an automatic one, this kind works best. It goes right down there, and uh, you have wonderful, tasty orange juice or grapefruit juice. Uh, I'd like to see you do that with a Yugo. It really doesn't work very well with a Yugo. Don't try that at home. But the juicer works uh, works very well. So we'll we'll put that over there. I'm sorry, that was a mistake. But the juice is good. Mm. Excellent. Uh, unfortunately, I do have a Yugo award. Here we go. The Yugos, as Spanish legend tell you, was made of old hood ornaments. The first ones from 1950 automobiles. And here we have one of those, beautifully uh, chromed and ready to take off. It looks kind of like a, a, one of the vehicles from, uh, from Star Trek, if you look at it, with the two uh, nacelles, is that what they're called? The two long thingy things. And, uh, wait a minute, the Ugo started in 1953, Star Trek wasn't on until the late 60s. How could they have a Star Trek spaceship? Oh. No, that's wrong. This is not a Yugo either. This is an Alfie Award. And it is made from an old hood ornament. This is, this is from a 1950s DeSoto. And why the makers of DeSoto knew that Star Trek was coming was Gene Roddenberry, when he designed the Enterprise, inspired by the DeSotos of the 1950s? I have no idea, but this is an Alfie Award, which no one has won yet. Um, I'm sorry. Another mistake. I'm, I'm a little tired from doing all these videos. Uh, I have a Yugo around here. Oh, here it is. Here we go. A Yugo Award. The Silver Rocket Ship. The iconic Silver Rocket Ship, as famous among fans of science fiction and fantasy as the Golden Eunuch of the Emmys, or, or of the Oscars, rather, the Golden Eunuch of the Oscars, or the, the woman with the thingamabobby of the Emmys. As I said, Fanish legend says that the first Yugos, the 1953 Yugos, and those of the years that followed, were made from hood ornaments from 1950s cars salvaged from junkyards. That is the Fanish legend. The Fanish legend, as it happens, is wrong. Sometimes Fanish legends are wrong. That one is wrong. Jack McKnight and Ben Jason made the first Yugos in 1953 perhaps inspired by some of the rocket-shaped hood ornaments they saw on 1950s cars. And I have my crack special effects team here, so they should be putting up right now a photograph of the actual 1953 Yugo given in Philadelphia, designed by Ben Jason and Jack McKnight. There it is. Now you can say that was inspired by the hood ornaments of 1950s automobiles. I actually think it was inspired by the Orbit Jet, the spaceship piloted by Rocky Jones Space Ranger in a very popular space opera at the same time. And uh, if my special effects team here will put up a picture of the Orbit Jet, you can see the similarity. Note that the, the fins that are further up. You know, the latest Yugos don't ha have fins down at the bottom, but they don't have fins up. 
But the orbit jet did, and so did that first 1953 Yugo. It had the fin support way up. That's why I think that might have been their real inspiration. But sadly, we do not have Jack or Ben here to tell us the truth of it. But later cons, not having McKnight and Jason to hand cast their trophies, did resort to finding actual hood ornaments in automobile graveyards and junkyards, shining them up and mounting them on bases. For example, the Yugo for 1956 was an actual hood ornament from the Oldsmobile Rocket 88 bolted to a board. Here, here's one of those. Take a look at the 1956 Yugo. That is an actual Oldsmobile Rocket 88 hood ornament. In those days, the, the Yugo rocket varied quite a bit. One world con decided that golden Yugos would be better than silver. Two others went with translucent plastic rockets for reasons I will not attempt to explain. Like many old plastics, they have turned yellow over the years. But then again, the old hood ornaments, oh, hood, blah, blah, but then again, the old hood ornaments have rusted and corroded, as Alfred Bester himself testified at my very first Hugo Losers party. By 1984, the silver rocket had been standardized to what you see today, ones like this. And all thanks to Peter Weston for that. The Oscars don't have a different golden eunuch every year, after all. World cons today get very serious about not messing with the rockets. Have you seen those little lapel pins that Hugo nominees wear? Well, if we were in Wellington, you would be seeing them. The nominees would be wearing around with these little pins on their suspenders or, or shirts or jackets. Little tiny Hugo lapel pins. Uh, here's, here's one of them. Here's what one of them looks like. If my uh, special effects team can put up that picture. Thank you, guys. few years back at the last Australian World Con, that's the West Island, as my Kiwi friends tell me, I suggested that they take one of those little Yugo pins and put it on the rocket in a little pouch so the Aussies would have the first marsupial Yugo. I thought it was a great idea, but the Aussies slapped me down. The rocket is sacrosanct. You do not mess with the rocket. The bases, though, that's a different story. Every Worldcon has the right to design its own Yugo base. In the early days, that meant they would change the size of the hunk of wood that the rocket sat on. Some Worldcons had big hunks of wood. Some had little hunks of wood. Some had a little hunk of wood on top of a big hunk of wood for a, a wedding tier kind of thing. That all changed in 1976 at Big Mac in Kansas City, however when the Kansas City ConCom commissioned artist Tim Kirk to design a gorgeous round ceramic base with a dragon coiled around it. Since then, whoa, Katie barred the door. We've had rats, we've had Ultraman, we've had Yugos that required batteries, we've had ringed Yugos, bases made of wood, bases made of lucite, bases cast in bronze, bases made from the pieces of the Saturn V gantry. That was a pretty cool one. Because if, if you were in Wellington, we would have an exhibit hall and you could see them all. But they are all online. Check out the Yugo website and you can see many of the past Yugos over the years. This year's base was designed by a New Zealand artist, John Flower. So we're gonna bring him out now to hear a bit about his design for Con Zealand's Hugo Award. John Flower, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, my name is John Flower. I live in Palmerston, North New Zealand, and this year I had an opportunity to present a design for the base for this year's Hugo Awards. And the concept I came up with was to create a base made out of black glass, and on the base we have a bunch of hands, and they were used by early explorers, the Māori who came to New Zealand, to navigate through the Pacific. And the idea is that, depending on how many fingers that you hold up, you can measure the angle between 
set of stars and the horizon and work out where you are. For example, if you have the Southern Cross, which is made up of four stars, you can measure the distance between the top star and the bottom star. And if you rotate your hand like that, so it's say three fingers distance, down to the horizon, then you know that you have due south when you're in the Southern Hemisphere. So each of these gold hands is a different number of degrees and the constellations within there are known in New Zealand as Matariki. In other places they're known as the Pleiades or Subaru in Japan. And there are a group of stars that show up in New Zealand somewhere between May and June. And in New Zealand they're recognised as the beginning of the new year. We did all the design work using open source software like Blender and Inkscape. So here we have a sheet of Paua. Paua is a mollusk found off the shores of New Zealand. Uh, they've taken the shell of it and flattened it out. We have to use a laser to cut a spiral design in it. The spiral design combines the Milky Way with the pattern of endemic ferns of New Zealand. So we've cut out from here and if we move the sheet we can see what we've created. So that's cut out from the middle. And the idea is that on top of this power we will seat a timber design on top like so and the rocket will go in the middle. Like that. The Yugos are the oldest award in our genre. First given in 1953 at a Worldcon in Philadelphia, they were so popular that the 1954 Worldcon dropped the whole notion. But come 1955, they were revived and they've been given at every Worldcon ever since. When they started, the Yugos were pretty much the only award for science fiction fantasy or horror. Today, of course, we have the Nebulas, the World Fantasy Award, the Locus Awards, the Bram Stoker Awards, the World Horror Awards, the Tip Trees, the Dragons, the Saturns, the British Fantasy Awards, the Arthur C. Clarke Awards, the Prometheus, the Seuns, the Ditmars, the Vogels. Well, the, the list is long. and I'm sure I've left out many very important awards. And they're all wonderful awards. I've won some of them, and I would be delighted to win some more. So please, if you want to give me an award, go right ahead. That being said, the Yugo Awards are still, to my mind, the most important and prestigious award that any writer of science fiction or fantasy can earn. The true worth of any award is determined not by how many people have voted on it, or how big the cash prize is, or who's on the jury, or how handsome the trophy, although those are all nice to know too, but rather by its winners, and yes, by its losers too. Should you take home one of Uncle Hugo's silver rockets, you're joining a club whose membership includes Gene Wolfe, Aldous Boudreaux, Michael Bishop, Norman Spinrad, Howard Waldrop, Stephen King, C.L. Moore, A. Van Vogt, Damon Knight, Ray Bradbury, Damn, my mistake. I was looking at the wrong paper. None of those writers ever won a Hugo Award for fiction. Gene was 0 for 9, I think. But damn, he was good. So were they all. The winner's list includes Isaac Asimov, Ursula K. Le Guin, Anne McCaffrey, Harlan Ellison, Roger Zelazny, Robert Silverberg, John Scalzi, Frank Herbert, N.K. Jemison, Nettie Okorafor, Fritz Leiber, Orson Scott Card, Alfred Bester, C.J. Cherry, Loic McMaster Bujold, Samuel R. Delaney, Daniel Keyes, Theodore Sturgeon, Eric Frank Russell, and more. So many, many more. Not the least of them, Robert A. Heinlein, who was the Dean of Science Fiction. I know because it said so on all of his books. For years I thought that was a real title. Through the years, the Hugo Awards have been criticized for being too popular and not literary enough, for being too literary and not popular enough, 
for being too left-wing, for being too right-wing. Women did not win enough of them, it used to be said. Women win too many of them, it is sometimes said now. I say, phooey. What do you awards stand for, what I have always stood for, and will always continue to stand for, is excellence. And that is why we have gathered here tonight, virtually, to celebrate that excellent and all the amazing, astounding work that was done in imaginative fiction and fandom in 2019. Since I am not Lester Del Rey, we shall not begin with Best Novel, but rather with the Fan Awards, as is more traditional. There are four of them to present, Best Fanzine, Best Fan Cast, Best Fan Writer, and Best Fan Artist. And the fact that they exist is one of the things I love about Worldcon. I've been to a lot of awards ceremonies over the decades, the Nebulas, the World Fantasy Awards, the Bram Stokers, I've won the Carl Sandburg Award, the Arthur C. Clarke Award. I've been inducted into the New Jersey Hall of Fame. And I've attended the Emmys ten times as a nominee. All of these awards are wonderful in their various ways, but they all have one thing in common. They are awards for professional accomplishment. There's nothing for the fans. The Yugos have always been different. This is Worldcon's award, fandom's award. That is to say, your award and my award too. For long before I sold my first story, I was a fan. I still am. When the Hugo Award was first given in Philadelphia in 1953, there were only seven categories. But one of them was number one fan personality. As it happens, it was the very first rocket handed out that night. So one can say truthfully that the very first Hugo winner was a fan named Forrest J. Ackerman. To present two of the fan Yugos this evening, I am pleased and proud to present Con Zeeland's fan guest of honor, Rose Mitchell. This year we are meeting virtually because of the unique circumstances we find ourselves in. It is in the nature of fandom to embrace, explore and master new technologies, from mimeographs to phot photocopiers to email. We have always been on the cutting edge, finding each other and fandom any way we can. In that spirit, I am proud to present the 2020 Hugo Award for Best Fan Cast and Best Fanzine. Both of these categories represent the best traditions of fandom. The nominees and their colleagues around the world connect us, even as so many must stay isolated. Thank you, your work makes the world a little less lonely right now. We begin with the awards with the best fan cast. As so many of us find ourselves missing friends, family and fandom, podcasts have been an opportunity to invite new friends into about the things we love. Every topic imaginable is on tap and no genre has taken to podcasting like our community. Well, maybe true crime, but that's a different convention. Tonight's nominees are a part of a long tradition of taking new ways to communicate and bring their listeners a little closer together. The nominees for best fan cast are Jennifer Mace, Claire Rousseau's YouTube channel produced and presented by Claire Rousseau, the Cood Street Podcast, presented by Jonathan Strawn and Gary K. Wolf. Galactic Suburbia, presented by Alicia Krasnerstein, Alexandra Pierce, and Tansy Rayner Roberts. Producer, Andrew Finch. Our Opinions Are Correct, presented by Anna Lee Newitz and Charlie Jane Anders. The Skiffy and Fanty Show, presented by Jen Sink and Sean Duke. And now we go live to Santa Fe to announce the winner of the Hugo Award for Best Fancast. Hi there. It's me again. It's me. Hello in my fanish regalia. And uh, I am a fan as well as a pro, but I thought for these categories, 
in opening the envelopes, a little fanish help. So I've brought in Rhea Golden, one of my mighty minions. And Rhea is a second generation fan. Uh, her mother was a, a fan before her. And uh, for a long time, the best friend of, uh, of my wife, Paris, who sadly could not be here tonight. And they're both, uh, they're both true fans back from the 70s. And uh, I would like to say that Rhea was actually conceived at a Worldcon. Um, but the truth is, she was conceived at Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey. But, you know, they're pretty much the same thing. Yeah. So uh, yeah. there they are. So, <laughs> Rhea, who won Best Fan Cast? Let's find out. Let's find out. Breaking the seal. <laughs> oh, there we go. And the winner is our, opinion, our Opinions Are Correct, presented by Annalie Newitz and Charlie Jane Anders. We would like to send congratulations to Our Opinions Are Correct, presented by Annalie Newitz and Charlie Jane Anders for winning the Hugo Award for Best Fancast. Away. Thank you so much for this award. This really means so much to us. Yeah, it's especially great because we're an entirely listener-supported podcast. So you listening and donating is what helps us live. Our podcast is explicitly about the relationship between science fiction and society. And we believe that the unexamined story is not worth reading or writing. And science fiction is political because Everything we do is political, and we believe that stories become richer and more meaningful the more we analyze them. And right now, more than ever, we need stories that tell us about how we can rise up and change the world. But at the same time, we also need stories that help us escape, just to ease our pain and give us hope that this too shall pass. So we thank you so much for writing those stories and for believing in them. And also we thank our producer, Veronica Simonetti at Women's Audio Mission in San Francisco, where we record this podcast. And I'd like to thank Jesse Burns and Chris Palmer, my partners who put up with all this nonsense. So thank you so much, thank you guys. You. Bye. Things have been a vital lifeline connecting fans with each other when there was almost no other way. As new technologies come online, fanzines adapted but never lost sight of their core mission to connect, celebrate and inspire fans and keep fandom alive and bright, vibrant. Many fanzines are online. Some still get mailed around, but they are all spring from a deep passion for genre, community and fandom. No more than ever, that connects us should be cherished and celebration. Fanzines represent a thread back to the very beginning of SF and fandom. And tonight's nominees are all examples of the variety and depth that you can find in today's generation. The nominees for best fanzines are The Book Smugglers, editors Anno Grillo and Thea James. Galactic editor Janice Marcus, senior writers Rosemary Benton, Lorelei Marcus and Victoria Silverwolf. Journey Planet, editors James Bacon, Christopher J. Garcia, Alyssa McCursey, Anne Gry, Chuck Surface, John Coxon, and Stephen H. Silver. Nerds of a Feather, Flock Together, editors Adri Joy, Joe Sherry, Vance Cotria, and The G. Quick Sip Reviews, editor Charles Passour, the Rec Center, editors Elizabeth Minkle and Gavia Baker Whitelaw. Fanzine is The Book Smugglers, editor Anna Grillo and Thea James. No. We would 
to send congratulations to the Box Smugglers, editors, and Dick Jennings for winning the Hugo Award for Best Fancy. Come out to win. Uh, we are being wholly, utterly honest when we say holy guacamole. We did not see this coming. Thank you, fellow fans, readers, writers, and creators so much. We know that it can be frowned upon to be political at the Hugos, but we also know that everything is political. So at that, we've been running the book smugglers for 10 years, over 10 years, as two loud, opinionated women on the internet, one of us Filipino-American and the other Brazilian. Um, and we've been giving space to diverse voices to be heard, read, and seen. Um, and we know that's even more important now than it has ever been especially in the fight for social justice in the face of fascism, systemic oppression, and racism around the world. Black Lives Matter. So thank you so much for this award, our very first Hugo. Thank you for seeing us, for hearing us, for believing that our work matters. Thank you to all of our fellow nominees and to our regular contributors, especially Charles Pacer and AC Wise. Thank you to all of the readers and friends who have supported us throughout the years. To everyone who keeps coming back to read the book smugglers, we are nothing without you. Special shout out to the Sparkle Rocket and to the Filipino contingent at the Hugos. It's also worth noting that Anna is now the first Brazilian to ever win a Hugo. Finally, a huge thank you to the television show Lost, without which the book smugglers would never have happened. Thank you again from the bottom of our SFF loving hearts, and remember to stay safe, wash your hands, and wear a mask. Thanks. Here's another thing I love about fandom. It's generosity. Once upon a time, fanzines and fan writing were at the very heart of our community, both in the United States and over in the United Kingdom. But very few of the leading fans of that era had ever met, except through the mail. So a fund was started, the Transatlantic Fan Fund, or TAF, to bring English and Scottish fans to America for Worldcon, and vice versa. In those days, transatlantic flights were prohibitively expensive, but hundreds of fans reached into their own pockets and gave freely, just for the pleasure of meeting fellow fans from the other side of the pond. TAF soon became an annual thing, and is still going strong to this day, and other fan funds followed. Duff, Guff, Muff, Puff. No, wait, wait. Puff was a magic dragon who lived by the sea. Anyway, we have two of this year's winners here with us tonight to present the Hugo Award for Best Fan Writer and Best Fan Artist. I am honored to present Duff winner Aaron Underwood and Guff winner Allison Scott. Puff winner Little Jackie Papers could not be with us tonight. Hi, I'm Erin Underwood. I'm this year's Down Under Fan Fund Delegate. Science fiction and fantasy fans are notoriously passionate about their favorite works, and many of them are also gifted writers with a unique and irreplaceable role within the science fiction and fantasy community. Fan writers are the voices of fandom, asking the hard questions, satiating the curious, and creating new content that we, their fellow fans, are hungry to consume. They exemplify the passion, curiosity, and creativity of our community with every word that they write. Tonight, we celebrate the best of them. The finalists for the 2020 Fan Writer Hugo Award are Cora Bulert, James Davis Nickel, Alistair Stewart, Bogey to Cox, Paul Weimer, and Adam Whitehead. Good luck. Now. We go live to Santa Fe to announce the winner of the Hugo Award for Best Fan Writer. Ah, and the winner is...
Bogey Tech asks. Yay! Thank you everyone for thinking of me, for voting for me, and for spreading the word. I'm really grateful. And I would like to celebrate by spreading the word even further. I'm going to be recommending you more fan writers and book reviewers who you might want to follow and read and vote for. You probably voted for me at least in part because you like the lists that I make, so now I'm going to have a list. First of all, Lachon M1 currently reviews for Lightspeed, and she's an awesome fiction writer as well. Check her out everywhere you can find her. Latonia Pennington has the best takes on magical girl themes and also the best comics recommendations. Samira Nadkarni, who reviews for Strange Horizons right now, has some very lengthful and insightful reviews that I really recommend reading. Silvia Moreno Garcia always has the unconventional and the really, really wide breadth of books uh, within SFF and also outside of it. And also, I'm gonna say, buy her books and make the yellow duck happy. Uh, Charles Spencer is on the ballot in Best Fanzine for Quicksip Reviews. He has an immense breadth of short story reviewing, so please check that out. Vanessa Fogg also reviews short stories with so much grace and insight. I really like her reviews. Maria Haskins is awesome and her monthly short story roundups are always a delight. Make sure to seek them out. Amal El Mohtar, who you might know better as a fiction writer and a poet, but who's also a very thoughtful reviewer, so please uh, don't miss her writing. Uh, Tsana Delichva has detailed reviews of both comics and fiction in SFF for all ages. She's one of the highlights of my Goodreads account. And finally, Corey Alexander knows everything there is to know about queer romance and shares kindly, uh, both uh, within and outside of SFF. Ooh. I hope you enjoyed the list. Uh, thank you to everyone for their writing, and also thank you to my family who support me uh, when I get frustrated on the internet, especially my spouse, Arby Lemberg, uh, and their kid, Mati, who are both very encouraging. I also want to say a few words about life that are not going to be as cheerful. In both of my countries of citizenship, political extremism has been on the rise. In the US, anti-blackness, anti-indigenous, racist and anti-immigrant sentiments have increased and are increasingly accepted in the public sphere. While in Hungary, the government is demolishing independent media and curbing the civil rights of minorities while the EU stands by and does nothing. Most recently, trans people have been attacked. It would be false to assume that these events do not influence speculative fiction, and fandom in particular. Some of what I have to say in English is unpublishable in Hungarian, and who knows how long it's going to be publishable in English either. I often feel like the simple act of speaking is an uphill battle in itself, at conventions, online on social media, anywhere really. So if you feel like that, you're not alone. I am going to continue speaking as much as I can and working towards solidarity as best as I can. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Alison Scott and I'm this year's Guff Delegate. The Going Under or Get Up and Over fan fund exists to forge links between European and Australian and New Zealand fandom. I'm a UK fanzine fan and con runner who loves meeting new people and I'm thrilled to be virtually visiting New Zealand this weekend. The best fan artist Hugo is awarded to an artist or cartoonist whose work has appeared through publication in semi prozines or fanzines or through other public non-professional display including at conventions. I'm very honoured to announce that the finalists for the 2020 best fan artist Hugo are Ian Clark, Sarah Felix, Grace P. Fong.
Meg Frank. Ariella Hausman. And Elise Matheson. And now, we go live to Santa Fe to announce the winner of the Hugo Award for Best Fan Artist. Oh, and the winner is Elise Matheson. Yay! We would like to send congratulations to Elise Matheson for winning the Hugo Award for Best Fan Artist. Kamau Furehi. Thank you for being part of the Haiku Earring Parties. Thank you to everybody who ever wrote something inspired by the Shinies. Thank you for making this my best job ever. Thank you for inspirations and collaborations, and special thanks to Amal El Motar and Fran Wild for those. Thank you to Shauna Brown, best road trip convention room buddy ever. Art is not a sprint or a marathon. Art is a relay race. We are given something, we build it into something new, and we pass it along. Powerful art can call you to the work that needs you to do it. The art recognizes you, and you recognize it. You take it you make what you can of it and you pass it along because art that is passed along lives thank you so much for this i look forward to seeing the art we all make together in the future i think we have a beautiful yugo this year i hope all of you agree i think everybody who gets to take one home will be thrilled with it for a number of reasons but remember how i said that odd things happen at the Hugo Awards? Remember, I, I was telling you about 1973, the year of the first Campbell Award, when I lost my first major award in an almost empty hall. As it happens, there was something else that happened that year. Now remember, I'm a fiction writer. What follows is purely fiction. But sometimes I imagine what it must have been like when the CONCOM for TORCON 2 gathered a few months before the convention to go over their final plans for the Yugo banquet. It was still a banquet in those days. I can imagine the con chair sitting there at a table with his committee around him and saying, let's see, we want to make sure everything goes right. We sold the tickets. We have a good count, ordered the right number of tables, right? And we all sat on the food, we got the rubber chicken, the overcooked steak, something for the vegetable people, yeah, yeah, good, good. We got Lester Del Rey as Toastmaster, nothing could go wrong there. Have we ordered enough chairs for the back of the hall for those cheapskates who wouldn't buy a banquet ticket? Good, good, terrific. Oh, and the subcommittee to count the vote, we've selected them, if they've got all their instructions. Paper ballots, we should count them three times. Don't want to make a mistake. That would be very embarrassing. 
And we have to get the count early because we have to give the engravers enough time to engrave the bases, remember? Oh, and this, this new Campbell Award thingamajig, what the hell is that? Has Condé Nast sent us the plaques yet? Two of them. Really? Two of them? Okay. Great, great. It should go swimmingly. This will be a Hugo ceremony to remember. And indeed it was. Indeed it was. They only forgot one thing. They forgot the rockets. Yes, Blessed Del Rey presented the 1973 Hugo winners with empty bases. Their rockets were mailed to them some months later. And I guess they had to figure out how to attach them to those bases themselves. The only ones who actually get a trophy that night in Toronto were Jerry Purnell and George Alec Keffinger, the Campbell Award winner and the Campbell runner-up. But I'm pleased and quite relieved, actually, to report that Con Zealand did not forget the Rockets. So let's give one away to the best semi -pro zine. Now those of you who are new to the Yugos may be asking yourself, what is a semi-prozine? Well, a prozine is a magazine that pays professional rates for the materials it publishes. A fanzine is an amateur publication done as a labor of love that does not pay at all. A semi-prozine is in between. Semi-prozines pay their contributors, but not enough which, come to think of it, is true of prosines as well. So maybe I don't understand the difference after all. Perhaps our winner will explain it to us better. This year's finalists for Best semi prosine are Beneath Ceaseless Skies, Editor Scott H. Andrews Escape Pod, Editors Muir Lafferty and S.B. Devia Assistant Editor Benjamin C. Kinney Audio Producers Adam Pract and Summer Brooks, host Tina Connolly and Alastair Stewart. Fireside Magazine, editor Jul Julia Rios, managing editor Elsa Sundjesson, copy editor Chell Parker, social coordinator Meg Frank, publisher and art director Pablo DiFendini, founding editor Brian White. FIA, magazine of black speculative fiction, Executive Editor Troy Wiggins, Editors Ebony Dunbar, Brant Lambert, L.D. Lewis, Danny Lohr, Brandon O'Brien, and Caleb Russell. Strange Horizons, Vanessa Rose Finn, Catherine Kaj, A.J. Odasso, Dan Hartland, Joyce Cheng, Dante Lewis, and the Strange Horizons staff. Uncanny Magazine, Editors-in-Chief Lynn M. Thomas and Michael Damian Thomas, Nonfiction Managing Editor Mishi Trada, Managing Editor Chimadom Ohegbu, Podcast Producers Erica Ensign and Stephen Shapansky. And the winner of the Hugo for Best semi prosine Uncanny Magazine, Editors-in-Chief Lynn M. Thomas and Michael Damian Thomas, Nonfiction Managing Editor Misha Trota, Managing Editor Chimadam Oheg Ohegbu, Podcast Producers Erica Ensign and Stephen Shapansky. Uncanny, come ye forward and collect your Hugo. We would like to send congratulations to Lynn M. Thomas, Michael Damian Thomas, Nishi Trota, Shimidam Ohegbu, and team for winning the Hugo Award for Best Semi Protein. Come out and be here. We are so deeply honored by this Best Semi Protein Hugo Award, and we really wish that all of us could have been together in person tonight. 
It was such a fabulous group of finalists filled with friends and colleagues, so many wonderful magazines. Everybody should go out and subscribe to all these magazines and read them because they are truly marvelous. Uncanny Magazine is the work of numerous people, so we want to thank our 2019 regular staff of Michi Troda, Shimedo Mohebu, Erica Ensign, Stephen Schapansky, Joy Piedmont, Angel Cruz, and Carolyn M. Yoakum. All of our submissions editors, every contributor, the Con Zealand membership, and of course, our ombudsman and world's greatest daughter, Caitlin. And finally, a thank you to every single member of the Space Unicorn Ranger Corps. We couldn't do this without the support of our community. Shine on, Space Unicorns! Hi, I'm Chime Dumahebu, Uncanny Magazine's Managing Editor, and this is my first ever Hugo win. I'm the first black woman editor to win a Hugo in the semi-prosing category. Not the first to be nominated, but among the first. And it's an odd position to be in because black women have always been here and deserving in the genre. Not just as writers, but also as curators, editors, and arbiters of what speculative fiction can look like. So, yeah, this has been a long time coming. And it's been a long year. We are literally in the middle of a pandemic, and despite that, black people here in Canada, down in the States, around the world, and yes, in science fiction and fantasy publishing, have had to fight for rights and respect we should already have. So we look to speculative fiction for respite or for stories to top off our rage, to imagine futures and presents free of police and policing, and for stories that are with us in the fight and that remind us what we're fighting for. I'm so glad that Uncanny has gotten to publish some of these stories, alongside other excellent publications doing the same. Thank you to our authors for letting Uncanny be home to your words. And thank you so much to my teammates at the magazine, without which this wouldn't have been possible. Editors-in-Chief Lynn and Michael Thomas, Managing Editor Mitchie Troda, Nonfiction Editor Elsa Hunison, Assistant Editor Angel Cruz, Podcast Producers Erica Ensign and Stephen Chapansky, Podcast Reader Joy Piedmont, interviewer Carolyn M. Yoakum, and all of our submissions editors. Black writers, black stories, and black editors matter now. We mattered in the past despite racist opinions and policies, and we will matter in the futures that we create, the histories that we reclaim, the horrors that we rework, and all of the speculative genres and arts. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who voted for and who has supported Uncanny. It's an honor to share this category with the teams behind Beneath Lisa Skies, Escape Pod, Fireside, Faya, and Strange Horizons, all of whom are doing stellar and inspiring work in SFF. I'm proud to call you my colleagues. This Hugo Award is especially meaningful because 2019 was my last year of eligibility as part of Uncanny staff. I can't express how grateful I am to have this award as an end cap to my time with Uncanny, which has been such a huge part of my life. To all of my 2019 Uncanny teammates, thank you for everything. I'm so proud of the work that we did together and thankful to have contributed to such an amazing publication and community alongside you all. I'm especially excited to see how Chimmy is now making the role of managing editor her own, and I am so lucky to have gotten the chance to know her while we were on staff together. I'm so proud of her. Being Uncanny's managing and nonfiction editor was life-changing, and while I took many lessons from my time on staff, the most meaningful one to me is this. When you have the means to widen the doorway and bring others with you, especially if you have power and privilege, do it. We have a responsibility to be aware of the power we have and how we choose to use it because those choices can change everything. And that is especially important to remember now. So keep choosing wisely, Space Unicorns. I will always believe in you. Thank you so much. The Hugo Ceremony is, of course, a time to honor the amazing work done by authors, fans, and editors. But it is also a time to remember the members of our community who are no longer with us. This has been a particularly difficult year. Under normal circumstances, Worldcon is our chance to get together with distant friends, many of whom we only see once a year, and forge a large science fictional family. In the science fictionally future year of 2020, we are learning new ways to keep in touch with each other. The COVID-19 pandemic, which has forced Conzealand to be held virtually, 
is not just a minor inconvenience taking away our ability to travel. It is a deadly disease that has stolen members of our community from us. Since we saw each other last year in Dublin, we have had to say goodbye to past Worldcon guests of honor, convention runners, editors, authors, and fans. Let's take a few moments to remember our lost family members.
Okay, we're rolling now. We've given out five Yugos and two not a Yugos. If we were in Wellington, New Zealand, as planned, the seats in front of the auditorium would be filling up with happy winners, clutching their Yugos and wishing that I would speed things up so they could get to the parties. Next to them, the losers would be smiling very hard so no one would think that they were bad losers. Instead, everyone is scattered over the world. The winners have probably opened their champagne bottles by now, and the losers are free to weep into their small beer as much as they want. I've been there myself. Over the years, I've lost 19 Yugo Awards. The first was 1974 when my story with Morning Comes Miss Fall was nominated in Best Short Story. Warcon was in Washington, D.C. that year, as it will be next year. I was so prosperous by then, I flew to the con instead of taking the bus. I had a hotel room all to myself, and I even scraped up enough money to buy a banquet ticket. I was seated at a big round table with several friends of mine, all of whom were also on the Hugo Ballot. You know, that was the year that I finally made good on my dream of three years earlier. Someday I want to be on that stage. I did get on that stage to accept the Campbell Award from my friend Lisa Tuttle. When my own category came around, I lost. Afterward, my friends lost, one by one by one. Guest of Honor John Brunner observed our misery and sent us a bottle of wine. That was very kind of him. Right next to us, of course, was the winner's table, and the winners were hooting and hollering, slapping each other's back, toasting each other. When the ceremony was finally over, Gordon Dozois put an arm around me. Welcome to the Yugo Losers Club, he told me, as the others chanted, one of us, one of us, one of us. Gardner told me not to worry, I would surely lose a lot more. And I did, in time, though not right away. The following year I actually won a Yugo. But the con was in Australia, and I wasn't able to be present. Neither was Gardner, but the next time he saw me, he still ceremoniously drummed me out of the club. So to all of you who have lost tonight, or will soon lose in the categories yet to come, I can only tell you what Gardner once told me. It is a proud and noble thing to be a Yugo loser. Welcome to the club. Speaking of that club, two years later at the Kansas City work on Big Mac, after a night in which I lost not one, but two Yugos, Gardner and I threw the very first Yugo loser party in my room at the Mulebach Hotel. Only by losing two was I able to squirm back into the club. When winners tried to crash our party, we didn't just make them put on a funny hat, as we do these days. We pelted them with peanuts and made them tell us why they were really losers, too. And when Joe Haldeman dared to show up, having just won for Forever War, the fans picked him up and threw him in the pool. You do have to forgive them. It is an honor just to be nominated. It is, it is. But it's still hard to lose. It's marginally easier, mind you, when you lose to a work that you really admire. But even then, uh, the first time I ever lost the big one, best novel, was 1978 at IguanaCon, when Dying of the Light lost to Frederick Pohl's Gateway. I never expected to win that one, I have to admit. Dying of Light was my first novel, and Gateway was uh, terrific, a classic by one of the masters of our field. I remember at the loser's party, I went up to Fred and told him so. If I had to lose, I'm glad it was to you, I said. Gateway just blew me away. It deserved to win. And Fred nodded down to me and said, yes, it did. But moving on. Our next category is that for Best Professional Artist. Words and pictures belong together, and artists have been an important part of our field since the very beginning. The cover images of the old pulp magazines defined science fiction for half a century and influenced the filmmakers who would follow. 
At the very first Worldcon in New York City in 1939, the guest of honor was neither a writer nor an editor, but an artist, Frank R. Paul. At the very first Hugo Awards in 1953, there were not one, but two categories for artists. Virgil Finley won as Best Interior Illustrator, while Hannes Bach and Ed Emschwiller each took home a rocket for Best Cover Artist in the tie. In the decades since, the Best Artist Hugo has been claimed by such giants as Frank Kelly Frias, John Schoenher, Michael Whalen, Jack Gaughan, Leo and Diane Dillon, Bob Eggleton, Judy Dillon, Charles Vess, and many more. That's a hell of a club, and one that any artist would be proud to belong to. Let's see who the latest member will be. This year's nominees for Best Professional Artists are Tommy Arnold, Ruvina Kai. Galen Dara. John Picaccio. Yuko Shimizu. Elisa Winans. And now we go live to Santa Fe to announce the winner of the Hugo Award for Best Professional Artist. Thank you and welcome back to Santa Fe. And once again, I am gonna delegate the envelope opening duty to Rhea Golden, who in addition to being a minion and a second generation fan, is also herself a Hugo losing professional artist. Uh, well, in graphic story, graphic I novels, believe you lost right. graphic story a few years that's ago, right. and I'm sure you have many more losses to come, Rhea. <laughs> uh, as I said in my uh, videotape, uh, Rhea most recently uh, illustrated my own graphic novel, uh, Starport, mm -hmm. and uh, we hope to do more Starports in the future. Mm -hmm. So, but who won Best Professional Artist this year? Let's see. Let's see. Uh, and the winner is John Picaccio. John Picaccio. Yay! I'd like to send congratulations to John Fincasio for winning the Hugo Award for Best Professional Artist. Come out, play wiki. So I'm going to go, go, go. Here we are. Um, this is unexpected. The Locust was unexpected, too. That Solstice earlier was unexpected. I don't know why this is my year. This is a bizarre year. This is a awful year for so many of us. Um, first, got to recognize who I'm with in this category. Um, Tommy Arnold is, is blowing doors right now. I mean, the, the stuff that he's doing um, for these, um, the covers for tour right now are, are, are just amazing. Um, Galen Dara, I, I've loved your work for the last decade. You know, you already won Best Fan Writer. You're gonna win, I mean, Best Fan Writer, Best Pro Art, Best Fan Artist. Uh, I think you got that in 2012 and you're gonna get Best Pro Artist uh, before you're done, you're going to have both of these things. Uh, Ravina Kai, I'm a super fan of your work. 
I adore it. Alyssa, I, I, I'm, I'm new to your work, and I, I, I love the way you handle yourself. I love your work. You're a superstar. Um, and Yuko Shimizu, um, you're, 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 you're amazing. I mean, you're, you're beyond SFF. You're, you're loved throughout the whole uh, contemporary illustration world, and I just uh, I adore your stuff. Um, thank you to Irene Gallo, Lee Bardugo, uh, my literary agent, actually, Joanna Volpe, uh, and I did say literary agent, <laughs> um, for supporting me this year. Um, shout out to all my Mexicanics family. Um, I love you guys so much, and I look forward to you guys being in this position for many, many years to come. Um, you know, we, we were here two years ago in San Jose together at a Worldcon, uh, and um, you guys are going to be in this position over and over and over, and I'll be there with you. Um, and just thank you to everybody who supported Loteria, which I know is a lot of why I'm getting this this year. Uh, that is my sort of uh, independent project that I've uh, been creating for the last several years. It's a series, a visual series that will be eventually turned into a book. And um, I'm very proud of the work, and I've got a lot more to go. Um, I'm just going to sign off here by saying that um, we've got a very tough uh, next several weeks heading into November. And we're going to have to fight to, um, to get through this. We're going to have to stick together. And we've got a lot of battling to do. So let's go. Big job ahead. I love you guys, uh, all of you out there in the uh, Worldcon community. And um, thank you so much. Signing off. Take care. Behind every good right. Behind every good writer stands a good editor, sometimes several of them. For me, it was Gardner Dozois, who fished me out of the slush pile when he was assistant editor at Galaxy in 1970. Gardner went on to win 16 Hugo Awards as best editor for his work at Asimov's and on the annual Best of the Year and many other anthologies. The Hugo Awards themselves are named for an editor, Hugo Gernsback who coined the term science fiction and founded Amazing Stories, the first SF magazine. Yes, you could argue that Gernsback was first a writer, but try reading Ralph 124C41+, and you will be quickly disabused of that notion. In the century that followed, many other great editors came and went and left their marks upon our field. There was John W. Campbell Jr., of course, and his great rival, H.L. Gold of Galaxy, and Anthony Boucher of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. There was Ray Palmer and B. Mahaffey over at Amazing, Doc Lowndes and Donald A. Wolheim, the Titans, Ian and Betty Ballantyne, who pretty much invented paperbacks, Seal Goldsmith, who discovered Roger Zelazny and Ursula K. Le Guin, Ted White, Ben Bova, Ed Furman, Judy Lindell Ray, the late, great David G. Hartwell, and the amazing Ellen Datlow, who had the good sense to buy my stories for Omni, and on and on, up to the present. In the beginning, though, there was no Yugo for editing. In the 50s, magazines dominated the field, and so the Yugo was for best magazine. As more and more SF and fantasy began to be published in book form, however, and anthologies began to flourish, the Yugo rules would change, to recognize the editor rather than the magazine. Today we have two awards, long form for book editors and short form for magazine and anthology editors. To present the editing awards tonight, we have the only man who worked with all of them, Hartwell and the Ballantines, Boucher and McComas, Gold and Campbell, Farnsworth Wright, and T. Orland Tremaine and Harry Bates and Hugo Gernsback, I think he knew Jules Verne as well. Ladies and gentlefolk, I give you one of the great old ones, SFWA Grandmaster Robert Silverberg. Well, thank you, George. Uh, even though you called me one of the great old ones, uh, I can't deny old. Oh, this is, I believe, my 67th World Con. Uh, I went to my first one in 1953, and you don't get to go to 67 of these things without getting old, for which I make no apologies. It happens to everybody, except for those 
whom, to whom it doesn't. Uh, in the 1960s, I remember there was a whole generation of people younger than I who went around saying, don't trust anyone over 30. And since I was already over 30 at the time, I felt a little miffed. Well, a lot of those people are still alive, most of them now with canes or walkers or in wheelchairs. And I guess they don't trust anybody under 30 by now. But my favorite uh, philosophical thought about getting old comes from my old friend Robert Sheckley, who in a short story collection of his about 30 years ago, said in the preface, you may notice if you look at the copyright details that these stories were published a long time ago and therefore they may not be relevant to you and that I, the author, am quite old. Well, I am quite old. I think the stories are relevant or I wouldn't be putting them out in this book. And let me tell you, I don't like being old any more than you will. A lovely, a lovely thrust. Well, I don't like being old any more than you will, but it happened to me, and if you're lucky, it'll happen to you. George talked about my having dealt with the great editors of the olden days. And yes, I, I did deal with John W. Campbell, the greatest of them all, and Tony Boucher and Horace Gold and all of those other people going way back. Uh, it was quite an experience. He also talked about my friendship with Jules Verne. And I have to say that Jules and I did not have that much of a friendship. There was a problem. He spoke no English and my French was and still is quite poor. So we had some difficulties communicating. Uh, earlier today, George mentioned to me my friendship with H.G. Wells, with whom he thought I had worked. I have to deny this accusation. Uh, Wells and I never collaborated. We were close personal friends. Uh, he let me call him H, but that was as far as it went. A different Jules, Julie Schwartz, older man than I, uh, taught me something about being old. Uh, Julie, with whom I had a lovely friendship, was one of the first science fiction fans, published a fanzine actually before I was born, and in the 1930s became the first uh, specialist agent in science fiction. One of his clients was Stanley G. Weinbaum, who died about the time I was born. And another was H.P. Lovecraft, who died a couple of years after I was born. And I said to Julie, you were also the agent for Edgar Allan Poe, weren't you? Oh no, he denied that. And quite possibly he was telling the truth. We, uh, we are gathered here at the moment to honor editors with the you go for what they now call the short form. Well, in the 67 years that I've been going to these you go award events and I have gone, Lord help me, to every one of them, uh, there have been some changes. As George pointed out, originally this was a Yugo for Best Magazine. And after a decade or so, it was changed to honor Best Editor because there were then a lot of anthologies that were not at all magazines, but were publishing short stories and had editors and were qualified for the Yugos. In fact, I was once a nominee myself for best editor because I edited an anthology called New Dimensions back in the 1970s. The year I was nominated, all of the short story 
Witters came from New Dimensions. However, somebody else won the best editor, Hugo, and I still bear that grudge to this day. It's an odd thing that I have been asked to give out the what is now called the Short Form Award, and I'll come back to that in a moment, uh, because after all, though I was an editor briefly, and I did actually get nominated in this category once upon a time, I'm basically a writer, and there's a certain fundamental antagonism between writers and editors that grows out of the fact that the writer requires the editor to say yes to his work or the writer is not going to earn a living. I have had the experience of having the editors say yes many times. There have been some wonderfully perceptive editors who have bought a lot of my materials and that's why I'm still here to tell the tale. Occasionally along the way, one of them would say no. A difficult moment for both of us, but rather more for me because it meant I wasn't going to get paid. Now, I am not a practicing Christian, but what I do say when I hear that word no from an editor is the same thing that Jesus said when he was on the cross. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And this is a, a mark of humility for which I give myself great credit. I said I'd come back to the short form business. After they stopped uh, giving the award for Best Magazine, they began giving it to Best Editor. And then the book editors of the field began complaining that they were being left out because nobody really knew who a book editor was. Books appeared and they had the writer's name on it, uh, but not the editors. And so all of the best editor awards were going to magazine editors or the occasional anthology editor. The book editors would be stiffed. So new award was instituted. Uh, dividing the, the, the best editor award into best editor short form and best editor long form by which they meant best editor for short stories and best editor for books. Why they couldn't call it that, I don't know. To me, short form summons up the image of my late friend Harlan Edison or that of my beloved wife Karen. And long form to me gives me the picture of something long and slithery like a python or perhaps a sandworm. And I don't see the sense of giving an award for best sandworm to anybody but Frank Herbert. However, uh, that's the name of the award and that's what we're going to give out tonight. And so here we go with the winner of the best editor short form. The nominees are Neil Clark, Ellen Datlow, C.C. Finley, Jonathan Strong, Lynn M. Thomas, and Michael Damian Thomas, and Sheila Williams. Yes, back to Santa Fe. I have the editor. I have the envelope. I don't have the editor. They wouldn't fit in the envelope. And the winner is the amazing, astounding Ellen Datlow.
Ellen, come in New York. We would like to send congratulations to Ellen Dunlap for winning the Hugo Award for Best Editor of Short Story. Come out, then we. Hi. Um, by the way, George, I really love your hat. Um, thank you. Thank you for this great honor. Thank you to Con Zealand for your hard work in creating the first virtual world con. I know it's been difficult, and I know it's disappointing that we aren't all there in person, and hopefully we'll be able to do another one in the future. Thank you to my fellow nominees. You are all amazing. Thank you to the voters. And finally, thank you to all the writers who make my job such a pleasure. I hope to see you all in person next year in Washington, D.C. Thank you. And now we come to the companion Hugo, best editor, long form. And as I explained a little while ago, this is not an award given out to sandworms or pythons, but given out to book editors who have come to be very important in the field since the Hugos were first invented. At the beginning, there were hardly any books published. Uh, and those that were, were generally serialized in the magazines. So even when somebody wrote a great novel, Asimov, Heinlein, Alfred Bester, and won a, a Hugo for it, uh, the award went to the magazine that published it. Well, that stopped when the book publishers began picking up those magazine serials and publishing them. And now there are so many books being published that it takes Locus about 11 pages each month just to list all the new books of the season, of the month, actually. Well, somehow the editors made themselves known. Uh, it's not that easy because they don't have their names on the contents page the way the magazine editors and the anthology editors do. And so tonight we will give out the best sound uh, the best editor award for long form. The nominees are Sheila Gilbert, Britt Vide, Diana Foe, Devi Pillai, Miriam Weinberg, and Nava Wolf. And now we go live to Santa Fe to announce the winner of the Hugo Award for Best Editor, Long Form. Best Editor, Long Form. Well, we had our, our, our cat winner earlier. And now we have our wolf winner. The winner is... Wow, okay. Thank you so much to all of you. This is a tremendous honor, and it means so much to me, this year especially. When Saga eliminated my position last year, right after I won a Hugo Award, and while I was expecting a new baby, there's a minute when I felt very alone and isolated from this industry I had grown to love and the people within it. Sorry, give me a sec. But it only lasted a minute. The moment I announced my news, the tremendous and instant outpouring of love and support from the people who had made this industry feel like a home immediately reminded me that I would always have a home here, no matter what. That this industry and you brilliant, talented people who make it so weird and so wonderful had made a space for me. And so this Hugo Award, while already so tremendously gratifying, means more to me than ever before. It is once again worth noting that we work in, an, in a world, in an industry, where women, people of color, and people of marginalized backgrounds can be award-winning in their fields and still have to deal with getting passed over and marginalized by the people that they work with. It is not appropriate and it is not okay. And as an industry, we have to work to make the changes we want to see in our world. And that is one of the reasons why our work as editors, as shapers of stories, is so important. Because when the world is feeling dark and hope is hard to come by, 
Now more than ever, it is essential that we look to our fiction to help us shape the futures we want to see. That is why the books we publish, the stories we tell, are critical, now and always, and why I feel both overwhelmed and lucky to know that I've had a hand in helping these stories reach the people who need them the most. A few quick thank yous. Thank you, first of all, to my family, to my husband and my three small humans who I'm lucky enough to get to weather a pandemic with. I couldn't ask for a better quarantine crew. And thank you to my parents and my siblings, who have always been my biggest and best supporters. Thank you to my dear friends and colleagues at Subterranean Press, where I'm lucky enough to be editing novellas. Yanni, Bill, Gerilyn, Gwenda, and the entire Subpress team are some of the very best people in our industry, and I'm honored to get to make beautiful books with them. Thank you to the staff of Con Zealand, who worked so hard to put together a virtual convention and a virtual Hugo Awards to bring us together to celebrate the remarkable works of our industry, even while we're physically so far apart. Thank you to my fellow nominees, both the five other women in my category and the finalists on the whole ballot. You are all brilliant, and it is an honor simply to be included in your number. And thank you, most of all, to the brilliant writers whose books I've had the privilege of working on. Thank you for trusting me with your works, your characters, your worlds. Thank you for letting me help bring your stories to the readers who need them. Thank you for letting me be your partner in trying to change this world for the better, one story at a time. Finally, thank you once again to all of you for this award. I am overwhelmed and honored to accept. Thank you. Dramatic presentation is another area that warrants two rockets. One for short form, one for long form. In the years since the category has been split, short form has tended to go to television episodes, more often than not, while long form has been dominated by feature films. But it would be a mistake to conclude that the former is for TV and the latter is for movies. The split is actually by running time. Television shows, when nominated for an entire season's run, can and have won the long-form Hugo. A limited series or miniseries would also be eligible in long-form. Short films have uh, two categories in the Oscars, one for live-action and one for animation. In the Hugo Awards, all types of short films can compete for the short-form Hugo. So can all manner of other things. Do not make the mistake of thinking these categories are just for movies and television. Music is eligible. What we used to call record albums or LPs when dinosaurs ruled the earth. Now known as CDs and DVDs and MP3s and MP4s and MP whatevers. Rock operas are eligible. So are regular operas but not space operas or horse operas, please. Stage shows can be nominated as puppetry as well, I guess. A slideshow won the rocket once. So did the Apollo 11 moon landing. And no, that is not proof that the event was fictional. Thank you very much. All you conspiracy nuts, back in your holes. Also, it is not necessary for the best dramatic presentation to be, well, drama, as it is at the Emmy Awards. In fact, sitcoms have been doing very well in short form recently. Who might take this year's Hugo's? To present this year's fantastic finalists, we have two fantastic guest presenters. Let me introduce Richard Taylor and Tanya Roger from the Weta Workshop. Richard and Tanya are the co-founders of Weta and co-owners of the workshop. Uh, they have run the, this award-winning company together for over 30 years from Wellington, New Zealand, which is where we would all be if COVID-19 hadn't decided to screw up the world on and much of the rest of the world. Um, Richard has won five Academy Awards for various disciplines, including special effects makeup, visual effects, and costume design. He has also received four BAFTAs, two VES awards, and more than 30 other national and international awards for various sorts of creative work. In 2010, Richard was made a Knight Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit for his services. And in 2012, he was named New Zealander of the Year. Um, Tanya 
in addition to her work with Weta, also owns a gorgeous movie theater. Now, Weta is a wonderful tourist destination. If any of you ever get down to Wellington after uh, COVID runs its course, please do visit the Weta workshop. It's, it's an, amazing, an amazing thing to see. And while you're there, go down the street and visit Tanya's movie theater. Um, which I visited the last time I was there and you know I own a movie theater in Santa Fe, New Mexico and seeing Tanya's theater gave me a bad bad case of movie theater envy because hers is really really big and nice and wonderful. Um, at any rate um, it's my honor and privilege to uh, present them here. Uh, I wish we could all be together but uh, please give your most rousing virtual welcome to Richard Taylor and Tanya Roger of the Weta Workshop. Finalists for Best Dramatic Presentation Short Form R. The Good Place, The Answer, written by Daniel Schofield, directed by Valeria Migliasi Collins, Fremulin Three Arts Entertainment, Universal Television. Find us the answer? Oh, well, Eleanor, this kind of thing doesn't have just one answer. There might be 800. There could be zero. Who knows? You know, the journey is the destination, right? Let's get to work. The Expanse, Cibola Byrne, written by Daniel Abraham, Ty Frank, and Naren Shankar, directed by Breck Eisner. Amazon Prime Video. Watchman, A God Walks Into A Bar, written by Jeff Jensen and Damon Lindelof, directed by Nicole Castle, HBO. I was already in love with you. Before you even saw me? I don't experience the concept of before. So, there's no moment? Moment? A moment when you realize I'm in love. The Mandalorian Redemption, written by John Favreau, directed by Taika Waititi, Disney Plus. Hey, look, here you go. See? Take a peek. Everything's fine. What is that? I don't know. It's a pet or something. A pet? Wait, you ah! Serves you right. Stop that. Watchmen, this extraordinary being, written by Damon Lindelof and Cord Jefferson, directed by Stephen Williams, HBO. Nothing. Hey, boy, I'm your husband, Calvin. We have three children. Yes. You don't know what's really happening here. Doctor Who, Resolution, written by Chris Chibnall, directed by Wayne Yip, BBC. Doctor, I don't like it when you go quiet. This is the DNA of the most dangerous creature in the universe. Does it have a name? The Dalek. Santa Fe to announce the winner of the Hugo Award for Best Dramatic Presentation, short form. Best Dramatic Presentation, short form. And sitcoms rule. The winner is The Good Place, The Answer. Written by Daniel Schofield, directed by Valeria Migliasi Collins. Tremulon, Three Arts Entertainment, and Universal Television. We would like to send congratulations to producers Josh Segal and Dylan Morgan and the team for winning the Hugo Award for Best Dramatic Presentation on four. Kamal Hewihi. 
Hi, Hugos. Thank you for honoring The Good Place one last time. We humbly accept this award on behalf of the writer of the episode, Daniel Schofield, director Valeria Migliasi Collins, the creator of The Good Place, Mike Schur, Morgan Sackett, Drew Goddard, David Miner, our entire production team, plus our fantastically talented cast, including Ted, Kristen, Jamila, Manny, Darcy, and the incredible William Jackson Harper, who somehow magically made us all believe that someone as nerdy as Chidi could be as hot as Will. This is a true honor, and we thank you. The finalists for Best Dramatic Presentation Long Form are Avengers Endgame, screenplay by Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely, directed by Anthony Russo and Joe Russo, Marvel Studios. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Captain Marvel, screenplay by Anna Bowden, Ryan Fleck and Geneva Robertson Dewart, directed by Anna Bowden and Ryan Fleck. Walt Disney Pictures, Marvel Studios, Animal Logic, Australia. We can't do this alone. We need you. Good Omens, written by Neil Gaiman, directed by Douglas McKinnon, Amazon Studios, BBC Studios, Narrativia, the Blank Corporation. We are an angel and a demon. We're on opposite sides. We're on our side. It's up to me. Yes. Russian Doll Season 1, created by Natasha Leone, Leslie Hedlund, and Amy Poehler. Directed by Leslie Hedlund, Jamie Babbitt, and Natasha Leone. Business, make choice, baby. <laughs> birthday baby what was i just doing what what do you mean i'm out of here star wars the rise of skywalker screenplay by chris terrio and jj abrams directed by jj abrams walt disney pictures lucas films bad robot if this mission fails it was all for nothing all we've done all this time. What are you doing there, 3PO? Taking one last look, sir, at my friends. Us, written and directed by Jordan Peele, Monkey Paw Productions, Universal Pictures. It's probably the neighbors. But you have a family? Hi, can I help you? Zora, put your shoes on. If you want to get crazy, we can get crazy. And now, we go live to Santa Fe to announce the winner of the Hugo Award for Best Dramatic Presentation, Long Form. To help me with the envelope opening duties this time, we have another of my mighty minions, Elias Gallegos, a crew member from the Starship Night Flyer, which has unfortunately encountered some trouble in deep space. Elias, can you tell us who uh, won the dramatic presentation in long form before you go off and die horribly? I can. <laughs> Our winner is Good Omens, written by Neil Gaiman, directed by Douglas McKinnon, Amazon Studios, BBC, Studios, Narrativa, The Blank Corporation. Congratulations. And somewhere, Terry. We would like to send congratulations to Neil Gaiman and the whole team for winning the Hugo Award for Best Dramatic Presentation, Long Come out to Wee. 
having seen the list of the other nominees, I find it very difficult to believe that Good Omens has won the Hugo Award 2020. I made Good Omens because Terry Pratchett asked me to. I didn't want to. I had absolutely no intention of spending years of my life writing and then show running a television series. Uh, but Terry asked and I owed him that and I did. I had lots of collaborators, hundreds of collaborators making this, all the amazing people on our cast and crew. I particularly want to thank the indomitable Douglas McKinnon, our director, and Michael Sheen and David Tennant, our angel and our demon. But the most important collaborator for me wasn't there. He was there in my imagination, looking over my shoulder at everything I wrote, at everything we shot, and telling me exactly what he thought of it often in no uncertain terms. Terry never won a Hugo. Um, the only time he was nominated for a Hugo Award, he actually withdrew the novel from consideration, uh, telling people that if he had a book nominated for a Hugo, it would ruin his world con worrying. It wasn't that he didn't care, it was that he cared too much um, for all of the awards that he got, for all the acclamation, for all of the honours and the love heaped upon Terry during his lifetime. The one he really cared about was the Hugo Award and he would grumble about it to me, pointing out that he was never going to get one because they wouldn't give the Hugo Award to anything funny. Thank you, all of you, for giving Terry Pratchett his Hugo Award. And now we come best graphic story. What is a graphic story, you ask? Good question. It is not just a novel with some artwork. That's an illustrated book. A graphic story is, well, a comic book. Not like those comics printed on cheap newsprint that we bought off the spinner racks for 10 cents when I was a kid. Back then we called them funny books, even the ones that weren't funny. A graphic novel is a comic book for, for grown-ups, printed on slick paper with gorgeous art, sold in bookstores as trade paperbacks or even hardcovers, and they definitely don't cost a dime. Now, some of you know this, of course, but some may not, and that can lead to, uh, to difficulties. Back in the 1980s, I was a writer-producer on a television series called Beauty and the Beast. Some of you may remember it. Ron Perlman played the Beast, Vincent, a lion man who lived in the tunnels and sewers underneath New York City. Linda Hamilton was the Beauty, an investigator with the district attorney's office. It was a pretty popular show for a couple of years. And during the second season, the studio cut a deal for a graphic novel adaptation. We hired Wendy Peeney to do the art. You probably know Wendy best for her work on ElfQuest. Lovely lady, very talented artist, and she was a huge fan of the show. So we, we brought her out to Los Angeles to meet everyone, and I was assigned to show her around. I took her to the shoot, Gave her a tour of all of our sets, the, the tunnels, and Vincent's chamber, Father's chamber, the district attorney's office, and introduced her to the cast as the artist who'd be doing the graphic novel. Wendy had nice visits with Ron Perlman, Roy Dutrice, and Jay Akavone, made some sketches of them as reference. 
But when I tried to introduce her to Linda Hamilton, Linda refused to speak with her. She got icy cold, uh, very unlike Linda. She stormed away without a word, shut herself up in her trailer, and called her manager. I had, I had no idea what was wrong. Why was Linda so mad? Wendy was a huge fan of hers, such a nice person. It wasn't until Linda's manager appeared that we finally understood. Linda is not doing it, the manager told us. We've gone over her contract. You do not have the right to do this. This is an outrage, and we are not going to stand for it. If you go ahead, we will sue you. Even then, I, I did not get it. You'll, you'll sue us if we, if we go ahead with what? With this pornographic novel, the manager said. Graphic, I squeaked. Graphic novel, not pornographic. <laughs> Graphic. It's a comic book. It all came out right in the end. The graphic novel was a huge success, and Wendy's work was stunning. So it's important to define your terms. <laughs> this is the work of this year's nominee for Best Graphic, Not Pornographic Novel. They are Die, Volume 1, Fantasy Heartbreaker by Kieran Gillen and Stephanie Hans. Letters by Clayton Cowles from Image. The Guardia, written by Nettie Okorafor. Art by Tanya Ford. Colors by James Devlin. Burger Books, Dark Horse. Monstrous, Volume 4, The Chosen. Written by Marjorie Liu. Art by Sana Takeda. Image. Mooncakes by Wendy Zhu and Suzanne Walker. Letters by Joe Matt Gill, Oni Press, Lion Forge. Paper Girls, Volume 6, written by Brian K. Vaughan, drawn by Cliff Chang, colors by Matt Wilson, letters by Jared K. Fletcher from Image. The Wicked and the Divine, Volume 9, OK, by Kieran Gillen and Jamie McKelvey. Colors by Matt Wilson. Letters by Clayton Cowles from Image. And now we go live to Santa Fe to announce the winner of the Hugo Award for Best Graphic Story or Comic. And who will win? The winner is LaGuardia. Written by Nettie Okorafor, art by Tanya Ford, colors by James Devlin, Burger Books, Dark Horse. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, um, am I on? Okay. Hi. <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, okay, okay. Okay, fun Dark Horse team. This is fantastic. Um, what a time for this graphic novel. Um, this story is about, it's about identity, it's about immigration, it's about prejudice, diversity, travel, humanity, culture, and aliens. So much, so much. I'm just really proud and honored and very, very surprised right now. Um, the, the cover itself is a protest. The cover itself is a protest. Um, I hope this I hope book joins groups like Black Lives Matter in amplifying those voices in this country worldwide who are calling for justice, equality, and humanity. Um, I want to specifically thank my editor, Karen Berger, um, for one, for being an awesome editor, but also it was, you know, putting that protest on the cover, that was her idea, it was just a really great call. Both Tana and I were really nervous about putting something that political on the cover, but it, you know, Karen is an awesome editor and she knew, she knew. Thank you, thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you, Tana, of course, you are amazing. Um, the detail and just the 
you, you're bringing your own strangeness and weirdness, my strangeness and weirdness. We're just awesome together. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, my, my cat is right in front of it. Uh, thank you, James. <laughs> James Devlin, you rock the colors. It's such a really, you just did a beautiful job. Um, and thank you to the Dark Horse team. Amazing, just amazing. And thank you, readers. Thank you, um, Hugo voters, friends, everyone. And also thank you, Eisner. This, this story was inspired by a contract with God. And um, just, yeah, just thank you. Thank you so much. This, this is really amazing. Best related work. Related works. What are related works? Well, not fiction. The rules say they're not supposed to have fictional content. Biographies are related works. Autobiographies, works of criticism, art books, collections of reviews, memoirs, histories, and other things odder things, things that do not fit comfortably in any other category, so long as they are related to science fiction and fantasy. To present this year's Hugo Award for the Best Related Work of 2019, it is my great privilege to introduce the Hugo, Nebula, and World Fantasy Award winning author of Who Fears Death and Binti, Nettie Okorafor. Hi everyone, Nettie Okorafor here. I have been recording this for how long and I cannot think of anything productive to say because so much is going on right now that it's hard to really bring it all together. But I hope everyone's staying safe. I hope everyone is enjoying and reading science fiction and fantasy as well. So that said, the finalists for best related work are Becoming Superman, My Journey from Poverty to Hollywood by J. Michael Straczynski. Joanne Russ by Gwyneth Jones, University of Illinois Press, Modern Masters of Science Fiction. The Lady from the Black Lagoon, Hollywood Monsters in the, Le in the Lost Legacy of Millicent Patrick by Mallory O'Meara, Hanover Square. The Pleasant Profession of Robert A. Heinlein by Farah Mendelssohn, Unbound. 2019 John W. Campbell Award Acceptance Speech by Jeanette Ng. And Worlds of Ursula Le Guin, produced and directed by Arwen Curry. This year's winner is the Gravity Scummy. Jeanette Ng, 2019 John W. Campbell Award. memorials to dead racists is not the erasing of history, it is how we make history. And I am proud to celebrate that with you here.
And I am humbled to have contributed in this small way to these conversations, these revolutions within and without our genre. Not that I ever thought I was being controversial. Moorcock has been calling Campbell a fascist for years, but I like Moorcock's context. My voice is shriller and my, well, I'm not white. And that makes me sound angrier. I become graceless and vulgar. But I really didn't think I was saying anything new. Anything you didn't already know. I wasn't speaking to make change. I thought everyone already knew. And this was okay. They were okay with it. It was what normal looked like to me. So thank you, everyone who made it happen, who actually made it happen. Thank you to Alec Navala Lee, who wrote the book and brought the receipts. I am grateful you all proved me wrong, in this at least. Because it doesn't end here, it would be irresponsible for me to stand here and congratulate us as a community without reminding us that the fight isn't over and it extends well beyond the pages of our books. My dusty academic soul does not dream easily of futures, so I can't make pronouncements about our genre, except I want it to be something beyond my feeble imagination. I also know that for many, it will be truths as old as their bones, Forgotten things become new only because we forget, and historians like me can be just as guilty. Still, let us be better than the legacies that have been left us. Let them not be prophecies. Let there be a revolution in our time. Last time I gave a speech at Worldcon, I was literally hours after a march in Hong Kong, the my most cyberpunk of cities. Since then, things have gotten worse. Each of our worlds shrink in a pandemic. I mean, I'm literally telling you this from my attic, but I'm begging you not to look away from Hong Kong because we have more in common now than ever before. The tactics used to marginalize us, the tear gas thrown at us, it's the same everywhere and we fight them the same way. So we should come together to write a future of joy and hope and change. Now is the time. Now was always the time. Gone for Kong Gong. See by Kame. One more thing. Um, I have this hat. It was given to me last year. And um, it, it, it does a thing. Um, it does this. <laughs> best series. The best series category is relatively new, but the series itself is as old as science fiction. Older, in fact. Edgar Rice Burroughs published Under the Moons of Mars in 1912 and followed it with many more tales set on Barsoom. Hugo Garnsback did not start Amazing Stories until 1926, and it was several years later when he coined the term science fiction. L. Frank Baum preceded even ERB by a dozen years, publishing his first Oz book in 1900. Later on, Doc Smith gave us the Skylark series and Lensman books. He also gave us Powdered Sugar Donuts, but that's another story. It was Heinlein who coined the term future history, of his own was a very loose framework indeed. Asimov gave us the Foundation series and the robot stories. C.L. Moore wrote tales of Northwest Smith and Lee Brackett of Eric John Stark, Ray Bradbury of Mars. Jack Vance explored Leoness, the Dying Earth, and the Guyan Reach, and introduced us to five dastardly demon princes. And of course, there was Tolkien. Today, series books, trilogies, quartets, quintets, sextets, and future histories are everywhere. And it's hard to find a novel or a short story that stands all alone by itself, shivering in the cold literary winds. Which only makes sense, I suppose, 
World building is a huge part of writing science fiction and fantasy. And once you have built an entire world, there's so much to see and do and explore. To present this year's best series, Hugo, I have the privilege to present one such intrepid explorer. Last year's Triple Crown Laureate, winner of the Hugo, Nebula, and Locus Awards for Best Novel, who, for her sins, is also the president of the Science Fiction Writers of America. Let's give a rousing virtual welcome to Mary Robinette Kowal. Thank you, George. Since George has already introduced the category, I'd like to take the time to introduce you to each of the finalists. These are works that span a gamut, but all contain one thing in common, excellence in narrative over the span of not just a single novel, but a long arc of stories. These stories linger. Trying to sum them up doesn't do justice to any series, so I'm going to focus in on single quotes to give you a taste of the worlds that these books create and the lingering resonances within them. The Expanse by James S. A. Corey, Orbit U.S., Orbit U.K. There were two sides fighting, that was true enough. But they weren't the inner planets versus the belters. They were the people who thought it was a good idea to kill people who looked or acted differently against the people who didn't. Encrypted by Seanan McGuire. Daw. The problem with people who say monsters don't really exist is that they're almost never saying it to the monsters. Luna by Ian MacDonald. Tor. Galants. You pay taxes, but the law doesn't allow you any say in how they are spent, let alone the option to withhold them when you want to influence government policy. Planetfall by Emma Newman. Ace Galants. That was the second major lie I told that week. It gets easier in some ways. Now I lie without expending any effort. But I think each one has its own weight. One alone may barely register, like a grain of sand in the palm of one's hand. But soon enough, there's more than can be held, and they start to slip through our grasp, if we are not careful. Winter Night Trilogy by Catherine Arden, Delray, Delray, UK. Every time you take one path, you must live with the memory of the other, of a life left unchosen. Decide as seems best, one course or the other. Each way will have its bitter with its sweet. The Wormwood Trilogy by Todd A. Thompson. Orbit U.S., Orbit U.K. The idea of a singular hero and a manifest destiny just makes us lazy. There is no destiny. There is choice. There is action. And any other narrative perpetuates a myth that someone else out there will fix our problems with a magic sword and a blessing from the gods. Congratulations to all of the finalists, and thank you for the power of your words. George, your turn to do the honors. to announce the winner of the Hugo Award for Best Series. For Best Series. Boy, this is going to really make these guys hard to live with. It's The Expanse by James S.A. Corey. Ty, Daniel. You got it. We would like to send congratulations to Daniel Abraham and Kai Frank, writing as James S.A. Court for winning the Hugo Award for Best Series. Come out to Weehee! Daniel Abraham here. Um, about a decade ago, Ty Frank and I started writing a series of books for giggles and pizza money, and now here we are. It is incredibly gratifying uh, to be 
in this company and to be among these people and it means a tremendous amount to us that that the series has been acknowledged like this we owe tremendous debts of gratitude to a great number of people and we will be expressing that privately uh, later on right now we want to thank the writers who've come before us and who've been around us and who have created this genre that we are part of the conversation with uh, and the next generations that are coming up now and broadening that vision and broadening that conversation and broadening that perspective in ways that make it richer science fiction fantasy speculative fiction are more and more important in a world as the technology moves forward and as the questions of humanity and the ties that we have to each other become more and more at issue not just in our fiction but in our world and our news uh, it is an incredible honor to be part of the conversation and an incredible honor to be here tonight and to be with you and thank you all very very much and that brings us, at the last, to the final four. Short story, novelette, novella, and novel. Why are there three categories for various lengths of short fiction and only one for novel, you may ask? Simple. When the Yugos first began, very few science fiction or fantasy books were being published. The magazines dominated the field, and aside from a few serials, the magazines published mostly short fiction. Today, of course, novels and trilogies and series rule the spaceways. But when I teach workshops, which I still do from time to time, I still tell my students to start with short fiction, as I once did myself. I began with short stories, progressed to novelettes, then novellas. Six years in, I wrote my first novel. Eventually, I started a trilogy. 30 years later, I'm still writing that trilogy, which has grown to seven volumes. Maybe I should have stuck to short fiction. Short story is one of the older categories, going all the way back to the second Yugos in 1955, when it was won by Eric Frank Russell's Alamagusa. I'm quite fond of this category myself, as it happens, since once upon a time, I won it. That was in 1980, at Maurice Con 2, when I also won for Novelette. Yeah, nine years from my first World Con, when I watched from the balcony and said, someday I want to be up on that stage, I got up on that stage twice, in a single night, and in Boston, where I made that wish. And Robert Silverberg was once again the Toastmaster and presented me with both rockets. I'd barely gotten back to my seat with my first Hugo in hand when he announced that I'd won the second, and I had to go scrambling back onto the stage. I have absolutely no memory of what Silverberg might have said, or what I said, for that matter. But the night could not have gone better if I had written the script myself. Afterward, I hit all the parties, with two Yugos in hand. When I got to the Yugo Losers Party, Gardner Dozwa was waiting with a can of whipped cream in hand. He sprayed it all over my head and even had a maraschino cherry to top off the Sunday. One of the best nights of my life, needless to say. Let's see which of this year's nominees is about to have a night that they will remember forever. The finalists for Best Short Story are and now his lordship is laughing by Shiv Ramdas, Strange Horizons. As the last I may know by S. L. Wang, Tor.com. Blood is another word for hunger by River Solomon, Tor.com. A catalog of storms by Fran Wild, Uncanny Magazine. Do Not Look Back, My Lion, by Alex E. Harrow, Beneath Ceaseless Skies. Ten excerpts from an annotated bibliography on the cannibal women of Ratnabar Island, by Nibedita Sen, Nightmare Magazine.
Santa Fe to announce the winner of the Hugo Award for Best Short Story. And the winner, Best Short Story, As the Last I May Know by S.L. Huang. I'd like to say congratulations to Wessel Huang for winning from the Hugo Award for Best Short Story, Kamal Tawihi. Hi, Wessel Huang. Um, this story is so hard for me. Um, it's so hard for me to understand the atrocities that people commit against each other. And, and sometimes it feels like we'll, we'll never solve this, that we're, there will always be more, whether it's, it's 1945 or 2020, with, you know, with the brutal oppression of the protesters in Hong Kong, with, with black Americans being murdered on the streets here in my country and, and so much else around the globe. Um, but I do believe that we can fight uh, we can keep pushing, we can carve out pockets of goodness in the world and, and keep pushing those pockets farther and farther in our, our countries, our industries, our communities. And, and thank you especially tonight to the people who speak up and stand up for justice here in uh, science fiction and fantasy. Um, I, I'd like to dedicate this award tonight um, uh, to my editor uh, for this story, Diana Gill, who also brilliantly edited all of my novels up until now. And I, I'm so furious and sad that the pandemic has caused her to lose her job as my editor. And Diana, I wish you all great things in the world. Thank you so much for everything. Um, more thanks uh, to my agents, Russell Galen and Angela Chang Kaplan, uh, to my writing communities and crit partners, particularly uh, my first readers for this story, uh, Maddox Han, Toria Hegedush, and Rob Livermore, and uh, my sister, always and forever. And uh, finally, a huge shout out to my fellow short story finalists for writing some of the most absolutely amazing fiction uh, I have read this year. You all are incredible, you blow my mind, and it has been my absolute honor to share this category with you. Thank you. And now we come to Best Novelette. The second category I won on that magical night in Boston in 1980. And here it is. Here it is. That was first hand game, so that's the one I brought with me to uh, show you guys. From time to time, I am asked, what is the difference between a short story and a novelette? Let me explain it to you. A novelette is longer. The way I know the difference, I start writing a story, and when I get to the end, I count the words. If there are more than 7,500 of them, but fewer than 17,500, I have a novelette. More than that, then, well, a uh, novella is 17,500 words to 60,000 words. More than 60,000 words, that's a novel. And if you go to half a million words, you either have an unpublishable mess or a major international bestseller. Of course, of course, there are structural differences as well. Short stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Novelettes are the same, but with more middle. Novellas have a lot more middle, and we won't talk about seven volume trilogies. Thank you very much. This year, the finalists for Best Novelette are wonderful tales with terrific beginnings, satisfying endings, and just the right amount of middle. The nominees are The Arc Chronology of Love by Caroline M. Yoakum, Lightspeed. Away with the Wolves by Sarah Gailey, Uncanny Magazine, Disabled People Destroy Fantasy Special Issue. The Blur in the Corner of Your Eye by Sarah Pinksker, Uncanny Magazine. Emergency Skin by N.K. Jemison, Forward Collection, Amazon. For He Can Creep by Sheepin Carroll, Tor.com. Omphalos 
by Ted Chang, Exhalation, Borzoi, Alfred A. Nuff, Picador. And now we go live to Santa Fe to announce the winner of the Hugo Award for Best Novelette. And the winner for Best Novelette this year is Emergency Skin by N.K. Jemison. Forward click. We would like to send congratulations to N.K. Jemison for winning the Hugo Award for Best Novelette. Come out to Weehee. Hi folks, N.K. Jemison here. If you're seeing this, it's because I just won another Hugo. Um, so many, many thanks uh, again to the Hugo voters um, and also to the folks at Amazon who helped me get this story together. Uh, that includes my editor and my copy editor there, um, my agent as always, uh, my assistant for keeping me sane while I'm working on all of this stuff, um, and uh, also the members of the Altered Fluid Writing Group who, as usual, help me get my stuff together. Um, so that's it. Uh, stay safe, wear your masks, and uh, I am off to work on another book, and I guess I'll be going to make some space for my new rocket. Thanks. Bye. And now we come to Best Novella. Longer than a novelette, shorter than a novel, with lots of great juicy middle. Okay, I confess it, I, I love novellas. I love reading them. I love writing them. And novella has got to be my favorite all-time Hugo category. Over the years, the voters in the novella category have proved themselves to be far more discerning and intelligent than the voters in all the other categories. They've given the rocket to me twice. Who have they given it to this year? Let's find out. The finalists for this year's Hugo Award for Best Novella are Anxiety is the Dizziness of Freedom by Ted Chang, Exhalation, Borzoi, Alfred A. Knopf, Picador. The Deep by River Solomon with David Diggs, William Hudson, and Jonathan Snipes, Saga Press, Gallery. The Haunting of Tram Car 015 by P. Deji Clark, Tor.com. In an Absent Dream, by Sean and McGuire, Tor.com. This is How You Lose the Time War, by Amal A. Motar and Max Gladstone, Saga Press, Joe Fletcher Books. To Be Taught, If Fortunate, by Becky Chambers, Harper Voyager, Hutter and Stoughton. And the winner is And now we go live to Santa Fe to announce the winner of the Hugo Award for Best Novella. Ah, those pesky temporal anomalies. I'm sure that one day we shall find out how to defeat them. We would like to send congratulations to Amal El Motar and Alex Gladstone for winning the Hugo Award for Best Novella. Kamal Tawihi. On the screen, I heard it on the live stream and the other. Okay, all right, all right. Uh, all right. Thank you, honor, everybody. Hello. Max, oh, take it uh, away. Hey, hey, yeah, yeah, I was the one who's getting, okay, Kia ora, everyone. We are so, so honored to accept this award. Thank you so much, everyone who's read and loved This Is How You Lose the Time War, everyone who voted for it in a year when our fellow finalists are just so staggeringly brilliant. We admire you and your work so much, and it's been a real honor to be a part of this cohort. 
We're forever grateful to everyone who helped make all of this possible, to all the volunteers at ConZealand who've been working so hard to do absolutely unprecedented work on this scale. Thank you so much to all of the stuff that you've done to make this possible. And everyone who made our book possible. Um, to Nava Wolf, the best editor we could have hoped for and the best editor! Two two up, two down. Um, anyway, <clears throat> yes, uh, to Dong Wan Song, our extraordinary agent, and to everyone at Saga Press and Joe Fletcher Books who worked to get our book into the world, including but not limited to Greg Stadnick, Molly Powell, Joe Fletcher, and Millie Reed. I'd, I'd like to thank my wife, Stephanie, always and forever. My parents and my sister also for their constant support ever since I was, you know, phonetically spelling stories in scrap uh, notebooks. Um, Bob and Sally Neely, who've given copies of my books to literally everyone they know, I think. Uh, to Uncle Danny, who gave me his Lasnian Liber, and Uncle Paul, who gave me the Star Trek video VHS tapes back, back on those sort of things. It's just, love you all. I want to thank my husband, Stu, for everything from tea to terrible puns to, like, being extremely nervous with me <laughs> throughout this. Um, and I want to thank <laughs> my parents and siblings for a lifetime of cheering on my writing, for their steadiness and their constancy in the face of so many upheavals. I can never thank them enough. Annual celebrations, anniversaries, cons, they have a way of kind of sneaking up on you. There's a cascading lightning quality to the memories they evoke. You're living your everyday life and then all of a sudden you cross some invisible threshold and there you are connected with last year and the year before all the way back to the beginning and sometimes even earlier than that. <laughs> For many of us, this world con may feel like a break in a chain but we invite you to think of it instead as a broadening of space, a widening of our circles. In a sense, this is as world as the con has ever been. It's a vision of world con where the only borders are lines in time. To travel in time, you have to understand time. There's no one history of the world. Every telling leaves things and people out, but everything that happens has happened. We're taught history as if it's a letter written from the past and addressed to us. But if that's true, it's a letter from a sibyl or a spy, elusive, full of hidden meanings and secret writing. The work of a lifetime is learning to read between the lines and then learning to reply. You can't write back to the past. You can only write to the future. So write. Right? We have always fucking been here. <laughs> right? It doesn't have to be like this. Right? It gets better because we will make it better together. Right? This is how we win. Kia Thank you all so, so much. Thank you. Hello again, guys. I'm sorry we had a glitch there. As I was opening the envelope, we lost uh, we lost our internet here in Santa Fe, but uh, it's back now. So we have one more category, and I have another videotape uh, before it, and then a short farewell after it. Uh, and in between, I'll be reading who the winner is for best novel. But before I get to that, I wanted to say. Um, if we were in person, once this last category was announced, people would be rushing to the stage to have their picture taken. The losers would be heading out, perhaps to the losers party, perhaps to the bar, being consoled by their friends. Um, again, as, as uh, one of the founders of the Yuga Losers Party, I, I have a lot of sympathy for the losers. If you're friends with a loser, if you're a relative of a loser tonight, remember, it's a great thing to be a Yugo loser. And uh, go open your bottle of champagne anyway, even if you did win. Enjoy it. Enjoy it, friends. And if you're the friends of a loser, the proper way to speak to a loser at this point is to, you know, give them a little punch in the arm and say, you was robbed, or wait till next year, or you'll get them. Um, those things have consoled me in many a time. And you may be celebrating the winners tonight. <clears throat> you may have preferred other nominees or even things that didn't make the ballot. What I want to remind you all of, everybody watching this, um, is this is your award. This is fandom's award. 
If you didn't like the way it came out this year, <clears throat> vote for next year. You can sign up right now to be a member of the DC convention and it's not going to get any cheaper. So tomorrow would be the best day to sign up for the DC Worldcon next year. You can sign up right now for Chicago, which just won the right to uh, host the uh, convention in 2022. Hopefully COVID will be over by then. We'll all be together. But meanwhile, you can nominate for the Yugos. You can vote for the Yugos. You can express your opinion as to what are the best fanzines, the best fan writing, the best short fiction, the best dramatic presentation. It's all up to you guys. So participate. And for God's sakes, Americans, register to vote in that November election too. For Christ's sakes, let's try to get this country back uh, and let's try to Let's try to get a decent human being in the White House. And now, the big one. Best novel. And here I am on tape. Once again, I'll be back to you one last time. And that brings us, at last, to the final award of the evening. The big one. Best novel. Alfred Bester won the first one in 1953. With the Demolished Man, an enduring classic of our genre. The list of past best novel winners is synonymous with a list of the greatest science fiction novels of all time. The Left Hand of Darkness, Lord of Light, Hyperion, A Canticle for Leibowitz, Doom, The Yiddish Policeman's Union, The Forever War, Neuromancer, The Graveyard Book, The Man in a High Castle, Ender's Game. The list goes on and on. N.K. Jemison won three years in a row. Lois McMaster de Bougeold has won four times to date, tying the record set by Robert A. Heinlein, the Dean of Science Fiction, who will win the award tonight. Let me share another Hugo legend about the most dramatic best novel win of all time. The place was Chicago, the year 1962, nine years before my own first Worldcon, so I cannot claim to have borne witness with my own eyes, but I have heard the tale from those who were there. It was so long ago, let me impress this on you, 1962 was so long ago, it was seven years before the Jets won their first and only Super Bowl. The Hugo Awards were only nine years old, but Robert A. Heinlein had already won Best Novel twice for Double Star and Starship Troopers. And that night, he was a finalist once again with Stranger in a Strange Land. Could the Dean of Science Fiction possibly win for the third time in nine years? Or would the rocket go to someone else? Everyone wanted to know, except perhaps Heinlein himself, who was not attending the convention. Now the awards were still presented at a banquet, as was the custom in those days. The Blackstone in Chicago was a first-class hotel, so the food was perhaps better than usual, served by a phalanx of hustling waiters in white jackets. After the meal came the guest of honor speeches, then a few humorous remarks by the Toastmaster, Wilson Tucker. As warm and funny as ever, Bob began with the Fanish Awards, and worked his way through the categories in traditional order until at last he reached Best Novel. He ripped open the envelope, paused a moment for dramatic effect, and announced, and the winner is Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert A. Heinlein. Bob was not able to be with us tonight, but he has asked me to. And then the double doors to the kitchen flew open and out burst the Dean of Science Fiction in all his glory, clad in an immaculate white dinner jacket. Thanks, Bob, he called out, but I'll accept the award for myself. And the whole hall leapt to its feet in excitement and gave R.A.H. a rapturous standing ovation. Or so the tale is told. I was not there, mind you. 
but I have no reason to question the story. Never before or since has any winner made such an entrance. What a glorious, dramatic moment. Except, you know, every time I hear the story, I wonder, how long had Heinlein been hiding in the kitchen? I mean, best novel was the last award of the night. He had to be there through all the other awards, and the Toastmasters remarks, and the Guest of Honor speeches, and the meal. Did they feed him there in the kitchen? Give him a little table and chair besides the stove? Or did he just filch bikes of chicken as they were going past on the serving trays while nimbly dodging the gravy boats? What did the waiters think of this guy with a little mustache lurking by the green beans? Did they mistake him for one of them? I mean, they were wearing white jackets and so was he. Did the cooks realize that they had the Dean of Science Fiction in their midst? Did he help out by washing dishes? I mean, he hadn't bought a ticket. And as we all know, there ain't no such thing as a free banquet. Questions, questions. I have no answers for you. There are some things fans were not meant to know. But we can tell you who won the last Hugo of the night. The finalists for best novel are the City in the Middle of the Night by Charlie Jane Anders, Tor, Titan. Gideon the Ninth by Tamsin Muir, Tor.com. The Light Brigade by Cameron Hurley, Saga. A Memory Called Empire by Arcady Martin, Tor. Middle Game by Seanan McGuire, Tor.com. The Ten Thousand Doors of January by Alex E. Harrow, Red Hook, Orbit. And now we go live to Santa Fe to announce the winner of the Hugo Award for Best Novel. And the big one. Best novel goes to A Memory Called Empire by Arcady Martin. Congratulations, Arcady. We would like to send congratulations to Arcady Martin for winning the Hugo Award for Best Novel. Kamal Tewihi. Hi. Um, <laughs> wow. Uh, thank you all so very, very much. This is rather overwhelming, as you might expect, um, but I'm going to do my best to tell you how grateful I am for your choice in giving this book the 2020 Best Novel Hugo. It's an especially sharp honor to receive this award for my first novel. It's a kind of welcome, an invitation to stay a gesture of hospitality from all of you and a gesture that I deeply appreciate and which I wish so very profoundly was more easily extended to the authors, artists, editors and fans of color who deserve as much hospitality as I do. A Memory Called Empire is in some ways a book about the inhospitability of so much of the universe, the inhospitability of culture, of origins, of desire, the pull of exile and the counter pull of dominance the empire and its edges, the knife that hurts more because you'd loved it before it cut you. I think a great deal about what it means to be welcome in a place. I wrote a book which considers whether someone can ever truly be made welcome. In this current world, where we are isolated by illness and by political corruption, where I have listened all night to the tension between an idealized, simpler past and a complex, difficult and brilliant present, where all the lines of exile and longing for familiarity are drawn ever tighter and more painful. I'm still not sure about the answer to that question. In my book, I let Mahit Desmar have a version of an answer. For her to be welcomed into the heart of the empire is to lose the ability to truly go home inside her own mind. 
for me, that's actually a hopeful answer. For me, a person who cannot stop writing about exile and about desire, who is an American and a Jew and a climate activist and a historian, and who keeps falling in love with things bigger than her head, however unwisely, it is a hopeful answer to know that there is not a solution, not a good one. But right here and right now, I feel like I might sum it up a different sort of answer for myself about welcome. In this corner of the universe that I share with you all, virtually at the moment, but also cross-temporally, stretch from the time when I first read science fiction as a child and thought, oh, I wish I could talk to the writer who made this and ask them how and why and whether I've noticed the right things about it from there all the way to now and from now for the rest of my life going forward. Here, I have been made welcome. Thank you for inviting me in. Thank you for seeing the work that I'm trying to do on the sort of stories I'm trying to tell. What doors I can hold open and what belaying ropes I can send back down, I will. I want to thank my father who gave me science fiction when I was far too small to know better. We called it science affliction and I am gladly afflicted at the moment. Uh, my mother, who had the temerity to ask me if I was quitting academia to be a writer, she was right, and I denied it when she asked me. To my magnificent agent, Dong Wan Song, and my brilliant editor, David Lai, who combined to make me all, write all the parts of this book that should have been there all along, and always, and most importantly, to my wife, Bev, all of the stories are for you. You hang the stars, and I couldn't do this without you. Thank you all again so much. And that's it. <sighs> As this Worldcon was meant to be in New Zealand, which is to say, Middle Earth, let me close, as Gandalf the Grey did, by saying, Farewell, my brave hobbits. Here at last, on the shores of the sea, comes the end of our fellowship. Except, not really. There will be another Worldcon next year in Washington, D.C. Another Hugo Awards. More winners and more losers. The road goes ever on and on, and so does fandom. Uh. Hi, I'm Tammy Coxon, this year's Hugo Awards Administrator. The Hugo Awards are one of the most important parts of the Worldcon and how we recognize the contributions of creators and professionals in the field. But I want to take just a moment to also recognize the con contributions of hundreds of volunteers who give thousands of hours of their time, because without them, there would be no Worldcon to present the Hugo Awards. I especially want to thank my amazing and tireless Hugo administration team who went above and beyond the call of duty. And I want to thank the 1,584 fans who nominated works for the awards and the 2,221 who voted. We know from when your ballots came in that you were reading up to the very last minute so you could make the most informed decisions possible. Thank you. Hi, I'm Larry Dixon. And I'm Mercedes Lackey. We'd like to congratulate all of the nominees. And all of the Hugo winners for 2020. That's right. You've been part of the first ever virtual. Hugo Awards and congratulations to everyone. You make history again. Thank you.